Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> I'm fine. I finally managed to, to set everything up. It took a while because uh, now everything has changed um, because the original Zoom link expired because this day wasn't originally planned. So this is an extra day. Mm -hmm. And I, I decided that um, this is a good occasion to call a couple of people that I would really like to talk to because we haven't seen each other for a while. And uh, you're the first one. I have to say that we don't uh, know each other that much, but we met uh, once at a very nice event in Poland. And I was, uh, for a long time, I didn't know that you are also from, from the same country like me because uh, I, I never met you before. You, you, I think you've been abroad at that time already for quite some time. And uh, to my surprise, you are also uh, very involved and interested in the computational design. Uh, you even sent me your, your um, PhD thesis. Um, I think it was PhD thesis, I, I, as, as far as I remember. And I feel a little bit guilty that I didn't have time to, to read it through. I just uh, quickly scanned and it seemed like a, um, a proper scientific paper. And uh, it was a couple of years ago, and ever since, I'm, I'm thinking that I should really call you uh, someday or invite you to, to one of the events. Um, you were always on a short list for, for the meetups uh, that we are organizing, but um, eventually it turned out somehow differently. So I took this occasion to, to call you and to actually ask you about what you do. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Jan. It is uh, definitely a pleasure having me here and being uh, part of this uh, conversation. <clears throat> and I found it really interesting that uh, many people from Slovakia, from our home country, are somehow involved in, uh, in this realm of digital technologies and they are very active. And uh, that's great opportunity, especially uh, these days uh, in the COVID-19 kind of uh, situation we are standing in the front of. And um, I take this opportunity and, and I would like to introduce myself to the wider, wider community. Uh, if I may ask, uh, may I share the screen? Yeah, it's possible. Uh, just sure. just a kind of a short introduction. Absolutely. Okay. And can you can you see it? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Perfect. So my name is my name is Peter Bush. I am um, I am an architect. I'm educated as an architect and currently working at the Kent School of Architecture and Planning in Canterbury in the UK, which is very close to, to London. A position in the very nice uh, historical environment and uh, uh, with a close connection to all important kind of institutions uh, we are in touch with. Anyway, uh, maybe I would like to start a little bit uh, of my PhD background, my research and research interests. Uh, my PhD work has been dedicated to study of phenomenon of emergence, um, potentially as a, as a design strategy for urban environments and their development. I developed the computational legend-based model and city, emergent city, in order to investigate, uh, let's say, more complex relational qualities uh, in urban environments and potential tendencies of the urban patterns to grow and configure uh, based on special conditions to create uh, unpredictable urban patterns formation. Such a model can serve as a kind of a testing platform to understand social and spatial urban uh, interactions uh, while observing the equal spread of urban activities uh, uh, within the urban fabric and uh, different types of urban graininess, let's say. So this is a decentralized model, stochastic model of a city as a, or, or neighborhood uh, in the city of Singapore, uh, which uh, does not really represent uh, the reality as it is, but is kind of an abstraction of urban growth based on spatial crit criteria represented in a visual way. Uh, during my research stay at the Future Cities Laboratory in 2015, well, it was a while ago, I was a member of uh, an international team in the uh, 
so-called simulation platform, and we developed an interactive uh, graphical user interface for simulation uh, of traffic heat propagation called city heat. And uh, to contribute uh, basically on the overall understanding of urban heat island effect in the tropical environment in particular, and in this case, in the city of Singapore. Uh, this served as a kind of input study or foundation later on for the research project Cooler Calmer Singapore currently conducted at the Singapore Heat Center led by Professor Gerhard Schmidt. Uh, together with the team of uh, researchers at the Australian Institute of Technology led by Dr. Koenig, Reinhard Koenig and the Koenig Spaces Company, uh, Bauhaus University in Weimar and uh, Future Cities Lab, we developed or I was a a member of the testing team of Deconic Spaces Toolbox uh, for Grasshopper, a set of parametrical tools for Rhino Grasshopper interface tool for uh, generation fast prototyping and delivery and analysis of urban patterns and structure. I think it's uh, available and, and people can, can easily use it, download it. I spent almost, almost three years uh, working at the Chair of Information Architecture at the ETH in Zurich concentrating on uh, the aspects of smart and responsive cities and uh, what is the role of human, uh, of citizens uh, within the city and how digital technologies actually can be helpful in these processes. And uh, currently in my long-term research agenda, I'm focusing on aspects of large-scale automation and prototyping for future cities uh, and looking for ways and, uh, and possibilities how to harness technology in building processes to improve productivity performance, uh, productivity efficiency in the construction sector while uh, considering humans uh, and end users roles and their needs uh, in these processes and how can be integrated in the, even in the design processes uh, 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 themselves. Uh, I spent, uh, I don't know, seven or eight years uh, as a Celebram practicing architect um, in Prague before I started doing my research uh, in, the, in the past. And um, I've been working on many project studies, uh, competition entries and, and uh, realization with the, uh, let's say, the small, uh, small size or medium size architectural companies in, in Prague. Um, Anyway, you can explore all the projects in a more detailed way on my webpage, arca3d.com. And uh, I just would like to very briefly introduce uh, my role at the University of, of, of Kent and the Kent School of Architecture and Planning, which is uh, kind of a quite, quite young school, actually. It has like 15 years and there, there was an anniversary, 15th anniversary of, of the establishment. And um, there has been a new research center recently established last year where I am very deeply involved in as a, as a, as a member uh, called uh, Digital Architecture Research Center, the TSAP, DARC. And um, a Digital Architecture Research Center is the newest research center at the Kent School of Architecture and Planning focusing on the application of digital technology in architecture. And dark looks to explore uh, the creative use of digital technologies to enhance um, design and fabrication possibilities uh, for architecture and the built environment. And the uh, center has basically three main streams, which is uh, one of uh, focusing on generative design and computational creativity, then uh, another part is digital fabrication and robotics, and, and uh, the third part uh, led by uh, my colleague, digital visualization and mixed reality. And we also, we just recently opened a new uh, Master of Science program in biodigital architecture, uh, which provides uh, students with the skills and know-how to practice architecture at the cutting edge of digital design. And the aim of the program is to provide a systematic understanding of core and advanced aspects of digital architectural design and the applicability of biological theory to enhance participants' architectural thinking and perspective uh, of the built uh, environment. Uh, this program will introduce students to thinking about architectural form and spatial organization as a bottom-up generative process, highlighting the aspects of relational qualities, again, between the form and the wider environmental conditions. So this was very brief intro of, of uh, uh, 
uh, myself and my my work, what I'm doing. Uh, long term, incredibly right. impressive. Uh, I think I can hear myself from from your uh, speaker. Um, it's actually it seems like there are so many common interests that, that we have. It's uh, mainly the the phenomenon of uh, emergence and generativeness, and how can um, things self-organize uh, as bottom-up systems. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you? Uh, I've got a series of questions that, that I announced that I will uh, ask you, but before you mentioned that before you went to uh, to teach at uh, the foreign universities, you were also abroad in Prague, but, but that's almost like being at home. And you said that you collaborated with the various uh, studios. Was your collaboration also somehow related to the computational design? Well, uh, at that time it was, I don't know, in 2000, 2006 when I started to, uh, to to practice as an as an as a practicing architect and um, uh, of course I was that time I was aware of this uh, realm of digital technologies and emerging kind of uh, uh, field and how digital technologies can be used in the in the uh, architectural design processes right and uh, that time, uh, these uh, medium-sized uh, studios, they used uh, AutoCAD or architectural desktop, so-called, that time, which somehow there was, there was this notion of, of, uh, of automation in a certain kind of uh, very uh, focused uh, single tasks, let's say, uh, during, during the process and, and during the delivering the drawings and so on. So, there was something already there, and I and I later on I started using Grasshopper uh, interface uh, in the in the kind of ordinary practice, right? So, for instance, for delivering the kind of facade elements or, or exploring the patterns and so on. So it was, in a way, uh, actually that time I started to to somehow more uh, more uh, concentrated or or more curious about about these technologies and and. That was later on the reason I, I started doing my PhD because I just would like to go really deeply into in, in, into this realm somehow. So yes, there was there was a kind of a slow transition between <laughs> between between the practice and, and research. Well, that's your um, <laughs> approach. I was uh, also wondering uh, a little more about the appreciation you when you were working with other architects, uh, your colleagues. They, were they interested? Did they see it as something exotic, or did they want you to do that, or discourage you, encourage you? What was your experience back back then? They definitely wanted to do that. I mean, uh, obviously, it's uh, something that it's still kind of uh, somewhere in the in the background, uh, and and uh, architects wanted to somehow pursue these these uh, strategies let's say but but it's a very slow process in practice because you are uh, constrained with the many kind of practical aspects uh, you need to uh, you need to keep in mind that there are some deadlines and so on and so on so you do not have so much time to exploring more deeply into into certain um, certain tasks so if you had your own studio and team and um, a job would you would you start from from the very beginning to apply the computational design maybe when it comes to urban planning was that is that something that if you had a great set, like perfect setup w would you go for that now absolutely. today absolutely yeah and you absolutely. think that the tools are ready and you think that that you are ready to handle that project they are they're absolutely ready because uh of course, there are many, many tools available right now, and and uh, certain certain set of tools can serve to certain particular uh, design scenarios or certain particular, let's say, analysis aspects. But they are very helpful. Definitely, they are they 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 are very helpful, and they are ready to use. Absolutely, so, no doubt. Cool. Let's. Uh, uh, it's actually great to hear that because it means that that the time is right, and whatever we've been talking about here for a week is something that that can be can be applied today. And and yeah, the time is right is is, is something that that could be a motto of of this whole conference. Um, exactly. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And also, 
uh, there is another aspect uh, because uh, <clears throat> architecture is starting to become a kind of uh, uh, available uh, or accessible to much wide, wider audience and starting to be multidisciplinary, right? So it's no longer about uh, that uh, we have one kind of um, master author of everything, but, but it's starting to be multidisciplinary and quite complex. And also the users and users themselves are uh, or might be or can be involved in these design processes and development of, of, uh, of the scenarios. And I think digital, digital tools can be very, very helpful in these in this processes. What is, according to you, crucial for a computational design? What makes it fundamentally different from um, any other approach to architecture and design? Well, uh, I consider computational design processes not really as a, as a uh, goal that we need to somehow embed in architecture because it's, it's a just a way how to achieve certain kind of uh, more wider particle goals, right? So the, 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 the role of computational design, it's not to uh, being kind of pursued uh, and, and forced um, and used uh, that, we, that we definitely need to use this, this, uh, these tools in, in, in a design process, but it's a kind of just a tool, right? It's a tool. I, I, I know, I understand, um, I, and also I agree, but this is also kind of a dangerous thing to say to people who don't understand uh, what is it all about. Because in my experience, usually when you when somebody is saying something like this, and I don't uh, expect you to, to mean it that way, but when I hear something like that, it means that there is always this notion of architects sketching, sketching with a pencil and, and that is not enough to achieve the, the uh, artistic virtue. And then they are using the computational power to actually achieve something that is incredibly classical and conventional. And that's not something that I can observe in, in the presentation that, that you are showing. So uh, I understand what you're saying, that it's a tool for achieving some higher concepts, but I think at the same time, we, we need to specify what those con con mm, intentions are, or the concepts are. Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, as I said, I mean we cannot use uh, we cannot use the computational design strategies to uh, create a let's say a very complex scenario, right? So, uh, but but anyway, I mean probably there is a, there is a kind of a let's say contradiction between the between the concepts uh, because at the same time uh, we need to tackle more kind of wider and more complex problems. Uh, in architecture and 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 the you know the world is changing in a way uh, that it's starting to be uh, that we need to as an architect actually our role is to be aware of much wider aspects that somehow uh, influence the notion of, of architecture or, or urban environments and and here in this process is computational des design tools uh, will be or should be uh, definitely helpful Right, and um, uh, it's it's a it's a very complex, actually, a very complex uh, conversation. I think. No, no, <laughs> but we've had it. But we've had it for some time, and people who are watching us are probably ready for that. Anyway, uh, let me ask you my final question, uh, and then we will open this discussion also to to other people. We already have Mateusz Zwierzycki here, so maybe he can join in as well. Uh, and maybe then there is something that you would like to say or discuss as well. Uh, I'm not saying that you should be asking me, but maybe something that you want to want to say uh, aside of the, the the planned questions. So my final question for you is, what's next? And you can understand it like what's next for you or what's next for what should be next for everybody, what you wish was next for architecture. Uh, what's next? It's a, it's a very good question. Uh, I think the what's next uh, should be, uh, I mean, this notion should be dedicated to, to people because <laughs> I think uh, technology does not solve everything. Uh, technology, it's uh, again, I'm repeating myself, technology is just a tool that can be helpful, but it will not 
solve uh, our problems as uh, as humans, right? <laughs> I mean, it's everything about the people. Architecture is uh, it's a people-centered discipline, and uh, this is in contra contradiction with the social distan distancing we are we are somehow uh, facing. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, this human humanistic role of architecture is is the most important one. So this is the next focusing on people, not on technology. <laughs> Conclusion. <laughs> that's a very, that's a very nice final word. Um, I would like to to invite everybody else uh, in this chat to actually join in and ask or say something. Hi. Hello, Mateusz. Long time no see. Last Good time day. I saw you, you looked like like Alan Turing. Now you look like some evil villain. <laughs> yeah, uh, Professor Xavier. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Welcome, Mateusz. Yeah. Hi, hi. How are you? Uh, very well. A little bit tired after a week long lectures. And oh yeah, I know that. I know that feeling. Yeah, I know, I, I know that. <laughs> I know you do. Have you ever? Uh, you did. Uh, met, uh, you did meet Peter, right? Uh, we were at the same uh, conference in Pozna, uh, in uh, uh, Rotswa, in Rotswa. Poland. And I met Peter. Peter there. He was probably not in our course, right? Uh, when we were teaching no, there. No, I don't think so. Yeah. But I think I think I know the name. But I know the name because you are mentioning him uh, here and there. Yeah, that's what I said at the beginning. Uh, this is, um, I, and the sad thing is that we I actually never reached out and and I never called him before. Uh, we met there at the at the workshop and conference uh, where we all three of us uh, were attending and uh, Peter sent me his uh, PhD thesis and it was it was a scientific paper about emergence and um, complex systems and self organization bottom up systems and um, super interesting stuff. Also also I don't know if you were following us on Facebook maybe you've seen the yes. presentation. Yes 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 I saw it very interesting indeed. I mean, uh, I think back then we discussed uh, the, the, his work, like your work, uh, <laughs> but yeah. it was four years ago? No, it, it's much, it's six at least. Oh man. Yeah, okay. I know. That, that's I know. really flying fast. I know. Yeah, I know. All right, uh, Peter, if uh, uh, you, you told me that you're attending uh, one of the workshops here at the Digital Futures, uh, is that right? Yes, that's correct. I'm attending the Architectural Geometry and Habitat, uh, led by uh, Zaha Code, ZHA, ZHA Code, but uh, Vishu Busham and Shajai Busham and, and these guys. Awesome. Awesome. It's also very important to 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 point out that that we always constantly need to learn, and uh, this is also um, an opportunity for for everybody to learn, even though you might be an expert in one field, it's always great to Absolutely. To learn it's somehow it is, I mean, this workshop is uh, somehow related to my own research, uh, my own long-term research agenda. And I think the uh, architecture as a discipline and we as, as architects, uh, we are constantly learning. We are constantly learning during practice, during research, uh, meeting other people. And uh, this is very important. Uh, that we are always kind of open and, and ready to learn new technological kind of approaches or, or techniques. And that's great. And, and this digital uh, futures platform, it's, it's a great, great, great uh, uh, space for, for doing that. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I will let you go now to, to attend your workshop. It was a pleasure to have you. and, and um, I promise that I will uh, call you more often, and I would really like to to uh, talk a little bit more about what your work. And Thank you very much. Thank you for for uh, for having me and your kind invitation to, uh, to this conversation. It was a it, pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you very much, and bye bye. Uh, hi, Mateusz. Hi. How, How are you doing? How are you again? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It, it's, we haven't seen each other for a really long time. The last time I think it was at the meetup in Prague, wasn't it? It's two thousand. Yeah, like in person, yeah. In yeah, person. In person, yeah. Three years oh, ago. Three, three years ago. Okay. Yeah. Three years. 
uh, which is a long time because we used to uh, used to meet each other at least twice a year or so for for quite yeah. a long time. You were yeah. coming here very often for workshops, yeah. And then you kept inviting me to Poland, which was awesome as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were in Wrocław, but you never oh. you never came to Poznan, right? No. No. Yeah. Why? Why would I? <laughs> you never came to Pieszczyn, which is my hometown. Yeah, but I wanted to, and then. We wanted to go there last year, but then we decided, like for like, like for a holiday trip. But then we decided we just want to exactly. lay flat on the beach and just sunbathe. Exactly. So you never came. So that's why I never came to Poznan. Okay. <laughs> so uh, Mateusz, what have you been up to? I I really like. Not only we haven't met, but I also I haven't heard much uh, from you uh, lately. Yeah. So what what have you been up to? Well, okay, so. I officially started, I don't know where to start. I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on because I'm, you know, active at a couple of different fronts. So only, only say the stuff that you're allowed to say. I'm pretty sure you're also in some very secret. Uh... Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, object wise, which is the company we are running, uh, you know, we have clients, which is good. <laughs> and how many people uh, are you? How many I'm people sorry? are you? I'm sorry? Uh, in, in object in the company, how many people yeah. are you? I mean, right now we are just me and Chris, but then we have some more people joining us for separate, like specific projects. And now we are working to get a third person uh, for a more like stable position where we can work in long, long term. Uh, I think in the very beginning, we wanted to have more people and we actually collaborated with more people in a like, you know, stable manner, but at some point, I realized that like 80% of my time is just scheduling other people's time. <laughs> yeah. And I, 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 I didn't, I didn't want that. It. Tell me yeah. about it. And also, yeah. there are the fill-in forms. I, I feel like there is every day there is a fill-in form that I have to fill. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And at some point, I had like three different apps just for scheduling other people's time and tasks. And it was just not manageable as a, I think, work from home solution. I think with enough is it might be possible, but it's impossible to get uh you know that many people in poznan to do that and you know it's, it's yeah let's let's speak a little bit about that so so in object you are offering some geometrical consultancy and problem solving using all the computational tools when it comes yes to yes we we do that we do that but we thought that we are going to do that for architects but now architects is our least least uh active clients with profile right and i mean who is, who is the client then we can say <laughs> no i mean in what field oh Still. yeah so manu like manufacturing you know kinds of the industry if you right. if you ever saw like a showcase of rhino where and where, where it's used mm -hmm. it's very it's a very broad uh, you know it's a it's an application used in a lot of different manufacturing areas you would never expect like I never expected, for instance, and uh, we actually get clients from that. And you know, is the it, history. Mm -hmm. Go on. Uh, is it relevant? Um, is is uh, Grasshopper relevant for like machine engineers? I thought that they've got their own Katia and, and stuff. Yeah, no, no, they actually... not, that. not that. Like, yeah, yeah. It's like yeah, there is this hardcore engineering, and then there is uh, like manufacturing, which we are closer to. But okay. we are we are not really working with those people who use Inventor and you know yeah. other stuff. This is a completely different branch. There yeah. is there is this just this specific like I know we are not working with, so I can tell you what we are not working with, but I'm aware that Rhino is used there quite a lot, is basically shipyards and ship design, ship hull design. And I know that there is a lot of companies consulting that with Rhino in in as a, as the first hand first hand tool. So mm -hmm. Just it's you know we we come we all come from architecture but we are uh, working with like very wide different industries you know like Ryan is also using like automotive and uh, you know, like naval design architecture of course product design and yeah the, that's that's where the, the yeah that's it just shows the, the the spectrum right which I would I mean. You know, like when I started to code, I mean, I'm I'm not coding for a long time, but when I started to code, I I, I would have never have I I would never have thought that say say this I would 
okay, you correct me. <laughs> I would have never say that uh, it's it would be so wide. I would I was always expecting to have more architects, but we are yeah. It's it's quite sad, but it's also understandable. Like architecture right now in the building industry, I can't hear. I'm not sure why, but you, you can't hear. No, I can hear now. Yeah, because I wasn't speaking. Yeah, I think I think it's like automatically muting. Then not like yeah. anyway. So so we we don't work with architects so much anymore. We like everything around architecture, yes, but architects not really, which is a pity. And yeah, that's that may be a transition to my PhD because with my PhD, <laughs> we uh, I'm doing architecture right for my PhD. So uh, the focus, I mean, the topic of the thesis is established at the point at the at this point of time as uh, representation methods for AI in architecture or in architectural design. So basically, knowledge engineering, knowledge uh, representation for AI. Now, the, per like, the purpose of, of, of this thesis is to uh, answer the current questions and the main uh, one with, with AI in design. And the, the, the biggest question right now is why AI is not there anymore, like at all, right? The only current... Do you have a, a suggestion? Uh, I that... have a list of suggestions. I actually uh, for this year's ECAD, I, I got a paper, so you might uh, want to follow that later on this year. And there is an entire list of suggestions of why AI is not used in architecture as much as, 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 as the amount of research would suggest, right? So... Can you, can you mention at least some? Yeah, yeah of course. So, uh, first, I mean, okay, we start with uh, this... Uh, how would you say that? Like, generally, we have uh, the only AI tool which is used is optimization, and still, optimization itself. Like, I'm talking about Galapagos specific, specifically. Optimization is still uh, not by all re researchers considered AI, but for me, I like for my purpose, I'm considering it AI because I define AI as a thing which uh, aids or replaces humans intellectual work right so optimization falls into that uh, into that category so there is uh, galapagos and then we don't really have any more tools which are i mean we have generative design with with autodesk right now but it's also very very optimization oriented where research would like the existing research for the last 40 years would suggest that we would have at least a, a couple of more different applications right so uh, yeah the list the lists of issues which we have and I've, I mean this is something which I, I made a huge research like with reviewing like almost 200 papers from the last 40 years and it seems that there are some common problems with research for instance uh, well I mean the list uh, yeah the list is very broad and I cannot really say which which issue is the most important or the most uh, problematic list but there is uh, certainly a lack of uh, scientific methodology in the area right so we have as an example uh, layout optimization or layout design automation has something like 30 or 40 different algorithms right now but as far as I saw, no one is doing really comparative analysis of those algorithms, right? And this is something which you would expect from uh, from research which operates with non-quantifiable results, right? We cannot really have a number which say, says like how good a design is. We will always have to compare one design to another or one solver, one design solver to another design solver. And it's up to the human to decide which one is the best one. Something similar, which you can probably see with any, let's say, for instance, like the noise, the denoising algorithm research. It has the same approach where you compare two different images also with some numbers, like you know, standard deviations and and you know the amount of noise in the image. But in the end, the most important is comparing two images side by side and seeing how they actually look in print, right? 
So even if some algorithm has worse statistics for the you know, image denoising, if it looks better for the human eye, it's better, right? The, I would expect the same for uh, layout optimization, for instance. So there's this, then if, yeah, was, there's- yeah. I was at a conference in Prague and there was this guy from the US and I, I'm really sorry, I don't remember his name, but maybe you will know. He is doing uh, a research in AI uh, mm -hmm. in 3D, so uh, just like AI can can generate um, pictures of non-existing people, he's working with um, AI to generate three-dimensional non-existing um, urban environments from yeah. like uh, from the viewpoint of a, of a human eye, so like a, like a, a, a street line or or a, or a square. But the point is that he he was the point of his speech was that. It works really well for for uh, 2D photos, but it looks very weird uh, in 3D. It's like there's this uncanny valley, and it's like it's it's like a nightmare dream uh, stuff that that this generates. And he said that he would never expect the AI not to be like the same algorithms uh, mm -hmm. that work for 2D. He would never expect that they they don't work in 3D so much. Yeah. Did, did you know his work and I just no. maybe I can look him up but no no but I mean uh, yeah maybe you can look him up but in the meantime I mean this is really uh, it, it's a good point because we can see quite a lot of generative adversarial networks used for AI uh, like uh, image image synthesis or actually uh, interpolating in some like latent space between different images and you probably saw a lot of uh, those trials with images of architecture being blended together and just morphing from one to another. And it is uncanny indeed. Like I saw this uh, GIF or GIF animation with multiple skyscrapers like blending between each other. And it is uncanny indeed. Like it is something which could be out of nightmare, even though the same algorithm would, works perfectly fine, fine for faces. Which is exactly your point, right? Just with you know to the three D transition. Uh, I, I I never saw the three like a three D application of that. So um, yeah, there is a lot of research which you know like I'm my re my 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 research is based on um, let's say material collected around Acadia and ICAD and those conferences which are the big conferences out there. So I'm not really familiar with everything, but. <laughs> Um, with computer scientists, right? I'm not really looking that far. I'm looking only on our field, <laughs> which you know. which is broad enough already. Yeah, and then we have yeah. I mean, just to mention some other issues, we are basically running around in circles, not really making much progress because every decade we repeat the same uh, questions. So that's another. We haven't been around for so long, so it's been one decade at most. Yeah, yeah but I'm saying like the research. The research, uh, you know, crowd, right? We have like 40 years of, of research, and I see neural networks mentioned every decade <laughs> to yeah, solve exactly cool. the same problems. To solve and, the, the same problems. And they never goes for virtual reality. It's been around so many yeah. times. Like yeah, there are exactly. so many peaks of virtual reality. Uh, now the question is why it doesn't take over? Like why why it doesn't like have any grip in practice? Right? That's that's the question because I'm. For me, like my criteria for considering in my thesis, my cr the criteria for con to consider an AI method successful is whether it is used uh, in applied design or not. Okay. Of course, there is a lot of basic research, but you expect the basic research to become applied research, and at some point it should get to application, but it never does. <laughs> like, uh, I mean. If you compare it to, for instance, BIM and the research behind BIM and uh, representation methods, this is something which actually has a, con like, not really continuous story, but you can at least see the progress, right? And you can see that we talked about representation in the 60s, even with, you know, even Sutherland light pen and just cut drawings. We started there and then it, it successfully progressed over decades. I mean, it took way too long that it should, right? But but it is there, right? But I think I've been thinking about this throughout this uh, whole uh, conference. That I I spoke to many interesting people, and whenever they were making their presentation, they were always 
pointing out uh, the problem solving behind their projects. So they always mentioned why this is uh, something that is a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, even though every single time the design and the, the thing was an extreme, an extremely appealing, visually uh, mm -hmm. innovative thing. And uh, this is something that that is personally my problem that I get very excited about uh, something that I believe is incredibly cool and and mm -hmm. should be explored more. And I just believe in the thing itself. And mm -hmm. I'm not thinking that much about uh, the narrative behind the problem solving or, or the problem solving narrative. And yeah. um, even though it might be there as much as it is for, for the other projects, I just don't really pronounce the narrative. Mm -hmm. um, because I don't really care so much. And it seems to me also that could be the answer for, for the AI. It's really hard to find the narrative, what problem does it actually solve? Whereas exactly. with BIM, this is, this is straightforward. It, it, it's so obvious what BIM is solving. And mm -hmm. all the other things that actually um, eventually settled down and, and became part of the, of, of the tool set, it, it's obvious that all of them are solving something a problem that is very easy to name. Yes, but I also think that uh, reading what uh, Daniel Davis recently does, it seems that, I think it seems like, again, we are asking the wrong questions and trying to solve them directly, where we should be, I'm, I'm quoting Daniel Davis here, where we should be more talking about uh, assisting the designer just as, and this is really interesting comparison here, which he makes, just as we have uh, typing assistants, let's say in Gmail, right? Or, uh, you know, like calendars, which are nicely automated. They are not really smart, but they are, you know, assisting you at each, each point. And you can tell how expect, what are they going to do? Yeah. Exactly, right? And I'm looking into that. Uh, I mean, I started looking into that uh, with the same kind of attitude in terms of AI and design. And yeah, I'm kind of stuck at this point, right? I made this but huge analysis. Honest, but to be honest, this is incredibly disappointing for me because um, what I find interesting about the computational stuff is that it can somehow surprise you or bring solutions that you would otherwise never come up with. Mm -hmm. um, it's the phenomenon of emergency, and I would like to push it to, to an extreme where, yeah. I, where, where I know exactly that, like, the result is deterministic, and I know the, the, all the rules behind the result, but I really wish that the result is something that I would never expect. This is my, my wish. Yes. But again, what problem does it solve? And again, it's against what you yeah. are saying or what you were quoting. Yeah, yeah, that's but that's exactly that's exactly what I'm thinking about right now. Like we are, and what you said, I heard a lot already. Like I heard the same statement a couple of different times from different people that, that they are kind of disappointed that I'm saying <laughs> that there isn't something like a black box which which can produce surprising results. I think it, I think there is. I think there is just a, a very the, the problem is that we cannot create create a narrative that would explain what problem does it solve even though even though um intuitively i believe that that's the thing that that, that is the most exciting part of I the mean, whole thing I, I mean okay so my philosophy here is a bit different i think that it's not really about something producing a nice result for you i think that the designer ultimately finds joy in just designing on his own or her own and this is why we don't really want to be replaced <laughs> I just think that even if we have like something which produces some really nice results. And you, th and you think this is not really creating something on your own? Like, you know how much uh, personal effort and ingenuity and, and or creativity it takes to write a code. Mm -hmm. and, and when the code actually works, it doesn't matter what, what it is. If it's, if it's a grasshopper definition or if it's a computer game or if it's just a simple hello world, the, the, the joy of that actually running and working that that's awesome that it's it's a creative discipline yeah but it's it's only one time and then the designer has to come up with new designs every single time and it's really hard to come up with really innovative code every single time and also that, yeah that's, that's that, true but if you are just an architect that, that draws uh, houses for families you're also not being innovative uh, every single time mm -hmm. it's the same right 
Well, yeah, but then in this case, the problem solving takes like the problem solving is in. And there we are, and there yeah. we are. Yeah. So, like the the joy of being an architect and drawing those, you know, single family houses is just problem solving. It's fun to draw it because it's fun to solve like those small problems. Like okay, I see. so here I, here is like okay, if I could. Uh, assist you in that not replace you but assist you i think it's just a yeah i i think just coming from from the view that you want to have joy in design it really pushes backwards the ai part but it also puts it in the right spot for me at least in 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 like because otherwise like okay if if you think otherwise like you say that we have some something which produces really nice unexpected results that's exactly my my, my supervisor Ilya <laughs> you know Ilya Bukharev. he's know, saying yeah. exactly the same that he would expect something really unexpected. new yeah unexpected unexpected right but then then we have uh, but I'm also saying like it I lost my thought now but anyway did we this is you know what I mean right we have we I have know, that. I know what you mean I know what you mean yeah. and I, I will keep thinking about the um, the idea of the uh, super smart tool just helping you out it kind of makes sense i i, I need to think about it i yeah. i i was i actually uh, made a tutorial um like two years ago and i also explained that uh, a couple of days ago uh that we also started using grasshopper as something that is just uh doing a checkup of your rhino work so it doesn't really generate, but it, it yeah. constantly scans your, your uh, Rhino file mm -hmm. and checks if everything is um, okay and yeah. if everything fits. And that's also an incredibly helpful thing. So yeah, it is already happening also for us. Yes, yes, that's true. And a similar, a similar approach can be seen with the uh, Proving Grounds and Nathan Miller recently published the uh, Semantic Plugin. I'm not sure if they're calling it that way, but I remember it has semantic good name, where you attach custom properties to any geometry in Rhino, and therefore it becomes a BIM application, right? Uh, yeah, so, yeah. So you attach just some more information to it. Now this is very, like it's very great to see that because I, from you know, I, I read quite a lot of those papers on AI just to make this study, and I remember one paper from architects. Uh, from actual office, architectural office, which was UN Studio from 2012, I think, there is a soft BIM uh, paper. It's titled Soft BIM, and I can't remember the subtitle, but anyway, uh, Soft BIM is a proposal from them to skip the entire BIM and just go with attaching strings to uh, geometries. Uh, this is something which you have in Rhino and Archicad, as they say, and I think probably Revit also has it right now. And they said they were suggesting in this paper that instead of following some very strict BIM regulations, you should go with uh, just attaching textual data to your stuff and then writing very simple scripts to, you know, to query that data, which is like, it's super simple. I'm not sure how it scales. I mean, they showed it in the context of a, of like a multi-story, like high skyscraper, right? So it was already a big project, but, uh, it's, it was applied to if just the facade of this building. So again, I'm not sure how it scales up to the, uh, to the entire building, right? So- oh, well, But we do that too, actually. We, we, I, we are not att attaching strings, but we are reading names of the geometries and, and layers yeah. and do stuff based on that. Yeah. Uh, we do that a lot as well. So we, we are kind of building our own maybe BIM. I, I really try to yeah. avoid this, but, yeah. but we are informing the geometry and, and then generating something out of yeah. that all the time. But notice how, how fun, like, I mean, if I, if, okay, if there was no BIM, I would imagine it as a big bucket of text, right? And, and you then have that tool which can quickly search this big bucket of text and, and give you what you want, right? So rather than having an entire team, an entire, like a guy in the office who is just to coordinate the team to do everything properly, to use the proper tool for in, let's say, Revit or Archicad or whatever, to tag the rooms, for instance, right? Because I, feel, I think in Revit, tagging rooms can be done in uh, multiple different ways, or people do it the wrong way, right? In multiple different ways. And then there is a problem of managing that data, right? 
So rather than having that, why not to just make text and but then again, every project becomes this. Uh... I believe I believe that a software developer would tell you uh, it's strangely typed and uh, yeah. that's, that's a wrong thing to do. And yeah, yeah, you know. I, ex I expect so. But I think there is a right scale for everything. But anyway, uh, yeah, I think we almost run out of time, and you have an another guy coming in, right? Yeah, yeah, but he's still not here, so we can keep okay. on going, and we yeah. can we can ask our audience to join in. Because, I mean, what it all goes like, where it go, all goes right now is uh, what I wanted to mention you know, as the last thing which I was recently doing. I mean, last but not least, uh, was teaching, right? So I'm I'm teaching in Cottbus, uh, so we have a lot of. I've been like really nice combinatorial slash AI project right now, which, uh, yeah, they are progressing, let's say. But uh, I think there is some really nice, uh, some really nice actions going up, going out there. Now, um, that's my, that's my main teaching area. Uh, but also I'm teaching at EAC and uh, with EAC we have a master in robotics right an advanced construction right mrac program and maa program so i was teaching those programs uh, uh, machine learning and uh, i mean maybe i can share the screen with you because i wanted to discuss because this is a natural uh, continuation of of what we are talking right now and this like my research and then where it goes to so i think there is a couple of different projects i'm not gonna say which one is the best or which one is the most interesting, but I think that we will not have time to discuss all of them. So this was, uh, for instance, where, where we talk about this AI assisting you in design, we can also talk about uh, maybe a bit different approach where you have machine learning to use uh, some user survey data, right, in terms of design. And again, you know how, how you can have a configurator, like a, let's say, grasshopper script, send it to a client, and then the client has to adjust the sliders for, for himself or herself, right? So we have, uh, instead of that, we, are, we, we figured out that we can simply ask the, ask, ask the users to tell us uh, their uh, you know, favorite designs, right? Yeah. So the students created a survey for images and designs of a, with, the, with this parametric model here. And then uh, they randomly selected five images. Uh, those were two different surveys, right? So in each survey, they selected five images from that collection and asked people about which one of those five images is the most lightweight, for instance, mm -hmm. right? So based on, on this survey, they created uh, ranks for all of those different images and then designs and then the, like it's very uh, let's say speculative right now but the idea was to link images to designs and be able to mix different images into a single design and this is where the where the ai comes in right because you have those different ranks but then you can mix them together so take some average and then have a neural network recognize this as a particular design so this the a machine like machine learning in this case is a neural network it maps features to the science so features directly to uh, parametric inputs of a of a parametric model right but then those features are expressed as images <laughs> so this is like a really uh, i'm not sure how novel it is but i think in terms of design and, and just going further i'm really interested right now i mean this is my I'm getting interested in new stuff every five minutes and this is really bad for my PhD. But we have, we have this approach where we actually ask people about stuff which they see on the screen. We are not asking them to grade it from one to 10. We're asking them which one is their favorite. And I think this is, this, uh, you know, this is probably really well known in like statistics and probably in like you know, social studies and so on. But for me, it's, it's quite novel. And I, I, I just want to dig into that a bit more. And we have, you know, this another project which tries to do something similar and, you know, have AI generating, generate a curve based on that, some descriptor, right? So they are also asking people about, like, what do they think about the design? And then when you want to generate the design, you say, what, do you, what design you want to generate? And then it comes up with a solution for you based on those user experiences, let's say, right? 
And then I think the last one, I think Francesco is here, so maybe yeah, we can speed up a bit. Yeah, and then the last one, I think this is uh, also a very interesting project in case, in terms of application where they have a really complex, uh, how do you say that, system to optimize material use in, in architecture, right? And they created the database of elements. Then there is also the, I don't remember it was neural network. I think it was neural network which uh, found members which are similar to the members you're looking for, selected them from you from a database and assigned them to different parts of the of the building. I mean the design here is like it's just a you know, placeholder, let's say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but it's a very, very interesting project which they did. I think they started it in a different studio, and I think it's described here if you want to look for that. So it was, I mean, we had just one semester for that, but I think they it took a bit more than that. Uh, and then they, they create this really nice, really nice tool. And we had, I mean, when we were switching to Francesca, we had a really nice uh, workshop with volumes recently with machine learning and maybe Francesca. I'm not sure if Francesca is going to talk about it, but it was a really nice experience with uh, volumes with getting a really nice uh, group of students, participants. And actually we did uh, uh, some, let's say, uh, sympathy or, uh, yeah, like, uh, we, we we wanted to basically ask people about how how much they like some particular place in the office and predict the wear and tear of the of the office furniture and just you know to address uh, uh, you know the management of of the of the object and I see that already another student came up with the same thing but for uh, uh, food courts in in you know shopping malls where you can predict the wear and tear and the crowd. Uh, you know, crowds uh, behavior in this in this area with with machine learning, right? Based on user responses. Anyway, there is a lot going on, as you see. But I'm gonna wrap up as I as I think we run over time. A bit. There is, and I didn't even interrupt you because you were actually following my, my questions, like what is crucial, what is next. You you, you yeah. tell us everything. You told us everything. Uh, just a personal note: we should call each other a little bit more often. I think. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> we, we, we cannot visit, G, visit each other yeah. uh, these days, so at least uh, ma yeah. let's make these calls. But you, know, but you know how busy it is. I know very well yeah. how busy it is. But yeah. still, I, e even though it is busy, I really believe that we should uh, talk yeah. to each other a little bit more. At least we, we found this occasion. It took half an hour and was very informative, so we yeah. can keep it short also in the yeah. future. It's, it still is like a small piece. Yeah. And I don't know what's yeah. going up in the But if you do it more often, then you can cover yeah. all the small pieces yeah. and put them together. Matos, yeah. thank, uh, thank you very much. Um, let's let's move to to Francesco. Also, I have to say that I was mentioning you, Matos, very often uh, throughout the, the the workshop because you you, you actually are my personal uh, plugin maker and using your plugins all the time. Anyway, thank you. Um, welcome, Francesco. Hello, Jan. How are you? <laughs> I'm fine. I'm telling everybody that I'm a little bit exhausted after a week-long workshop, but uh, now this is a very nice um, uh, uh, finale for me because yeah. uh, I managed to, to talk to, to friends and, and people whom I haven't seen for a long time. So how are you doing? Francesco? Yeah, fine. Uh, I guess uh, also tired here. Uh, the, the whole team uh, and people around me have had a, a very, very intense lockdown period um, because of different projects and also because we've been um, producing a, a lot of face shield as I believe you've been doing too. I, I yes, saw yeah. some posts. So yeah, definitely for, for us, uh, it was, uh, I, I don't realize if for everyone, but for us, it was a very, very intense year. So I, I would, uh, I would say the general feeling now is very happy to be uh, not far from uh, summer holidays. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I have to say, we also have Nicolas here. Yeah. Uh, your colleague. Uh, yeah. Hello, and, everyone. Um, I have to say that I know both of you from Paris, from, uh, from a co-working place called Volumes. Uh, and also uh, Francesco is, um, uh, is leading... Um, Designed by Data program at the university. 
uh, maybe you can speak a little bit more. You can also uh, talk about uh, Driven. And last time we were organizing a meetup in, in Paris at, at Volumes with you. Uh, also, also Nicolas was involved and he was the main manager of the, of the event on your side. And uh, I only met you uh, uh, over there and uh, it, was an, um, it was a nice gathering and it was nice to know that there are uh, interesting people who do computational design on such a high level and, and with such a passion. So maybe you can, you can speak a little bit about, about stuff what, that you've been doing very recently. Um, aside of the pandemic, yes, we were all making uh, facial shields and, and also those sorts of protective things. Yeah. But, but, but let's pretend that we are back to normal uh, when it comes to the content of what we do, maybe. Or maybe, okay. maybe it's not possible. You can also elaborate on that. What, yeah. what, what the two of you have been up to recently? Uh, Jan, just one question. I think we, am I wrong? Did, did we do, I mean, we had two events, no, in, uh, yes. in Paris? Like the first one was, was the research meetup? Yeah, right? the first one was, was 2016, yeah. which was research meetup, and the second one was 2018, which okay. was uh, the um, Datascape, uh, Datascape's uh, main yeah, event, uh, which okay. was also, also the same form of the meetup, the, the informal networking conference. Okay. Um, Nicola? You're joining on, a, I mean, a improvisation, but I think it's fun, so. Yeah, no, I, I really like it. Uh, by the way, I would like to thank uh, Jan for inviting me. Um, uh, it's always a pleasure to be, uh, to be with you guys. Uh, can, can you hear me fine, by the way? Yes, yes, all good. All right, awesome. Um, so, uh, uh, you, do you want to begin by uh, uh, Datascape, uh, Francesco, or? Uh, Not really. Uh, maybe you can say where, where where you work right now, because I, oh, I'm yeah, sure, sure that Jan uh, is uh, up to date. I'm certain oh, yeah, that's yeah, why yeah. we are doing it. Yeah, I'm just going to introduce myself. I'm, I, I'm Nicholas Sinemo. I'm an architect by training. I got specialized, like uh, many of you, uh, in uh, in programming for uh, for design and architecture. Uh, I worked seven years uh, in Asia and, and in Europe. Uh, as an architect, then I joined uh, Dassault Systems. So I work as uh, in a software company now. Uh, my job is basically to develop uh, technologies and uh, for the AC industry and to help their adoption uh, for our partners and and uh, and obviously uh, clients uh, such as engineers and architects. But my my main I would say passion is always to understand how this technology can be really useful in terms of creativity, in terms of fabrication, and it's it's more a cultural and and even philosophical challenge uh, when you're really into into the subject. So uh, I, I really try to bridge those two culture. I would say the software uh, development culture and the architectural culture. And this is the and, and this uh, main I uh, would say this main topic brought us uh, Jan Francesco and myself to do gatherings such as Danascape because uh, we really believe that it was important to uh, bring in some events uh, different people whether you're creative a scholar or even industrial like that's a system it's really it's really important to bring those people. Uh, together and and because in in a way we share the same culture, um, so yeah we organized this this event uh, two years ago in 2018 with uh, Jan and, and Francesco. It was a, it was a festival of, of events. Uh, so uh, I think I think we had like more than uh, four or five different uh, conferences, roundtables. We had two different workshops, uh, more than uh, 300 people invited. And, uh, and, it, and to, to be honest, it was, uh, it was, it was awesome. It was awesome, but, uh, uh, but I can see that the thanks more or less to the pandemic, we're still having a huge offer in terms of uh, conferences and workshop online. And I'm, I'm absolutely amazed to see Uh, you guys having this conference, I'm, I'm amazed to see uh, Driven organized by Francesco, which are online workshops. I'm amazed to see this because 
I would have dreamt of this as a student. 10 years back, I mean, why didn't we get online courses uh, of Grasshopper, of, of, of programming, whatever? And uh, so I, I really think that thanks to this, this pandemic thing gave us the opportunity to shift from a YouTube culture where, we le- where, where I learned personally everything on YouTube. We passed from this YouTube culture to, I would say, a more community oriented culture, but in a more formal way where you really have experts sharing uh, knowledge in, uh, with exercises, with uh, uh, spreadsheets with, with, with whatever. So um, I'm really, I'm really glad to, to be part of uh, one of those, uh, yeah, e- events because I really think it's a game changer. Cool, uh, Francesco. Uh, we've already heard about Driven. What is Driven? Yeah. So, um, so Driven uh, comes from um, a, a lot of different, um, let's say, parameters that are. Conver- converging now. Uh, the first one uh, is that, uh, yeah, at volumes in our, let's say, um, uh, co working space, creative hub, I don't know how we should call this place, but uh, we've been uh, traditionally incubating uh, projects, you know, but without, uh, let's say, a formal and a structured uh, manner. So we always wanted to um, like uh, have, have the chance to uh, have a, a formal or uh, like a, a very um, structured um, program for um, incubating prog- projects that are related to computational design. This is something we wa- always wanted. I always wanted to do in volumes, but never, uh, let's say, make it happen. And at some point, um, with the, the Fab City Network uh, two years ago, um, we um, basically, I, I, we, we, we've been invited to join a consortium of uh, European research. Uh, and we won this grant uh, called Reflow uh, about circular economy. So we have, uh, it's a three year, uh, research program about circular economy in uh, six uh, European cities, and what we and basically this was the perfect chance to, um, on one side, um, create this uh, uh, incubation program, and on the other side also, uh, it was a, a a big chance for me to basically try to answer one of my big questions about computational design uh, recently, let's say in the recent years, which is um, why do I have this impression that we have um, technology who is uh, diverging from real um, problems? So I don't know if you share this with me, but uh, I'm I'm seeing uh, if I look at the world, the, the feeling I have is that On one side, we have major challenges to solve, one of which is circular economy, but uh, I mean, we can talk about the pandemic, about the climate change, about uh, anything uh, like that. We have this big challenge that seems very difficult to solve. And on the other side, when I look to computational design, it's like, it's a a field in which, uh, I mean, everything seems possible or at least, uh, you know, you have this feeling that technology can can do more than what you can. So the the question with Driven was how can we bridge this gap and try to use computational design to solve one of these challenges, which is, which is circular economy. And yeah, so the grant is a, a big chance because you have uh, basically we have uh, three years to answer that question uh, and to explore it. Maybe it doesn't make sense. That's why it's a big chance. That's uh, and it's so now, now we are like launching, we, we, we just launched this morning, the call for project um, for uh, having new project joining after the summer. Um, yeah, and I'm uh, working on that with Mateus and mainly with uh, also Andrea, Andrea Graziano that is creating the program. And yeah, actually we, we needed to have a, a talk with you, Jan, uh, uh, about this, how to involve you. Uh, maybe we can discuss it uh, live. I don't know if it's the right place, but definitely, I think we should do this call more often. 
Uh, and I, even if I'm very busy as everyone else, I think it's, we need to make time slot for this. It's, I mean, a great thing to, to connect and to, to solve maybe challenges of our, of our world. You actually both mentioned that, that uh, having these sort of conferences or, or uh, getting in touch together is a, is, a, is a great thing now, as we all think. We are also getting somehow tired of being online all the time, being, being on calls all the time. Um, but what do you think personally? Um, is it good for you that right now we are streaming online and we know that this will remain online like forever until YouTube is on? Uh, is that something that you find beneficial for these debates or is it something that is disturbing you? Uh, is it a good setup for you or not? Uh, I'm not sure to, I mean, I, I see that different dimension in this question. Uh, one dimension is, are you, uh, are you okay in this format, uh, live, uh, etc. more than on a physical meeting? I think it's something like that you are asking. No, no. I mean, okay. having no. an online Sorry. conversation either privately or publicly. Wh which one do you Ah, think? okay. Okay, 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 okay. Um, I think I'm uh, okay with both of them. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, de de uh, inf uh, depending what we want to achieve with the conversation, it's not the same being public or being right. private. So I, I, th I think that... Uh, in my ideal scenario would be to have a mix. Like, uh, uh, I think we should have private calls and I think we should also have some of these calls public. Yeah. So maybe, I don't know, once, yeah, that uh, makes once per year, we can do this public and then we can schedule uh, every two months uh, a private call between uh, some of us, maybe open uh, to, I don't know, a bunch of people of, let's say, experts or thinkers, I don't know how to select them, but a selected number of people. It would be great now to, to yeah. let's organize this now. <laughs> let's schedule the next one, please. <laughs> <laughs> Two months from now. Yeah. Uh, I, I would just add so, uh, something to say that uh, the, the, the risk of, you know, recording everything is and putting it on online is that it, it gets lost. And, uh, and uh, there's this uh, researcher, you know, in, uh, Nicholas Carr, who, who done a, a huge work on, on how the internet uh, disrupts our uh, vision of the world, etc. And he basically says that uh, we, even though we're creating more content, we have a hard time to create knowledge because the access to the right topics becomes more and more difficult obviously because you have so so much content on, online right so uh, i'm definitely for for this kind of talks but uh it we needs to raise the uh topic i mean the the access uh topic so how how do we get this to the right persons uh, at the right time that's also something that i've been thinking about uh when I was approached to, to become part of this Digital Futures Conference, I thought uh, that's something that doesn't have to be part of a conference because we are somehow isolated from the rest. But at the same time, it, has, it gets certain visibility and some people get an access to what we are creating here maybe better than, than uh, otherwise. Also, I think it's not that much important how many people you approach if you approach the right people. And I think this is happening here uh, right now that we are able to approach the right people with what we are uh, doing here. So, but in general, I understand that if you if you uh, fill the online space or any space with too much stuff and information, uh, then everything gets uh, noisy and and uh, little parts get lost. But still, I think it's a, it's a better concept to actually create something and maybe it gets lost rather than not creating it at all. Yeah, so totally can, agree. Yeah. Can I can I jump in uh, about this because we've been thinking uh, a lot about this, uh, especially with the driven team at Volumes, uh, because you know we switched to a full online format. What it should be uh, an on-site format for the workshops and mentoring of the incubation, 
and also this uh, it's a paid um, uh, incubation program so this is also the the, the discussion of uh, should the contents be uh, available or not for free etc uh, i mean uh, what you are mentioning creating a contents equal creating chaos if i'm doing the short path for me it's i mean you are talking about this the, both of you I, I i have the feeling like like if it was a problem uh, for me creating contents and chaos is is not a real problem it's more a, a a new a new i mean it's a change that it's happening and so what we are doing here at volume is how we face this change and uh, I think that the, the point is having people uh, to orient other people to the right contents. And this is the, the, the big value that we can uh, bring in. Uh, it's not uh, the workshop, the online workshop. It's uh, matching uh, this workshop with the right people and do the work before the workshop is, uh, is happening, which is... Okay. Yeah. We are on the same page. This is, this is exactly what, what I was trying to, to say as well. Um, guys, let's go a little bit into the content of, or like the core of the computational design. I would like to hear from you. Uh, Francesco, you already uh, somehow noticed there or, or said that the technology diverges from the real problems. And um, let's not really talk about the real problems, but how can the technology or computational design, what makes it, because you are both involved in this field, what makes it so unique that this is the field that you have chosen? And no matter what the problems are that you are trying to solve, no matter um, the assignment, I, what is crucial? What makes, what makes computational design something special as much, so much that you've chosen to become part of the discourse? Okay. Um... For me, yeah, I, I would say, so I won't talk about uh, the, the problem. I make, I'll make the exercise of not talking about the real problems, but still I think that I got into computational design at some point because I, I had and I have, or, oh, no, sorry, the, the comput computational design gave me and gives me this, uh, sense or feeling of impression or vision that we can uh, make uh, unexpected, uh, we can solve unexpected uh, things in an unexpected way. So it's something related to the, your previous conversation with Mateusz. I was mainly online with you saying that, uh, yeah, for me, the, the reason why I'm, I'm into computational design is that, uh, yeah, it, it looks like it makes it looks like things can made possible while they are not elsewhere and maybe i can uh, i can uh, say a few words of uh, how i got i started you now how i started being interested uh, like uh, 20 years ago almost 80 maybe uh, about technology digital technology in architecture uh, Grasshopper didn't exist at the time, but we, I mean, I, I had this workshop with um, Mark Forens uh, when, when he was still teaching uh, Rhino scripts. Uh, I think it's, it, was, it was one of the last uh, workshops he gave. And why I, I met him, uh, it was because uh, I was uh, working with uh, complex, non standard uh, forms. Um, I, I was studying with uh, a, a, an artist, uh, my final diploma, and basically uh, I was looking to make these forms um, feasible. And uh, and by searching, I ended up uh, in the blog of Mark Forns. Uh, so this kind of geometry that seemed impossible to make, but he, he was able to make it. So that was my... My, my first uh, impact, and I think nowadays, uh, like 15 or 20 years ago, I don't know, after, it's still the same feeling. I mean, I feel that I can make things with computational design that I, I can, I'm not able to do elsewhere. Um, I, I don't know if Matos is still here, but maybe if he is, maybe he can join in. Uh, but I think what he meant is not that 
we shouldn't be doing the unexpected with the or expect the unexpected from the computational design. I think he meant that it's hard, that it's hard to to do, it's hard to to bring into reality, it's hard to apply. Uh, but I, I I still think just as you said, it allows us to do things that otherwise we wouldn't be able to do. And for me, it also all opens new concepts that otherwise I wouldn't think of at all. Mm -hmm. uh, Maybe I, I would just add something. Uh, just, just saying that obviously, uh, problem solving is something that uh, is really seducing when you're, uh, when you're a student in an architect. Like uh, the first time you do programming, the first time you create your first program to optimize the facade, whatever, it's something that is always very uh, uh, overwhelming. Like you're super excited to, to do something like this. But if you put computational design in a, in a context, of, of an architecture office, you uh, realize how much value it has, how much financial value, how much economic value, and how much politic uh, value it is. So I, I, I might be a bit polemic here, but I really think, yeah, as we all know, the project context is a, is, is a, is a context of, of uh, obviously politic and power. You have uh, the contractor, you have architects, you have engineers, you have so many people in, uh, in, involved in a, in a project. And uh, the, uh, uh, I would say the mastering of technology is basically gonna, gonna give power to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to the people. So uh, an architect can actually have a lot of weight in a project if he has uh, those capabilities. So computational uh, design is actually not only about, you know, is designing, but it's also about uh, uh, rebalancing power between, uh, the, between the different uh, stakeholders of a, of a project. And I'm, I, and I'm seeing it being part of a, of a software editor. I can, I can assure you that uh, like, when, when you see the, the willingness of people to invest in technology, it's obviously for designing better, but it's also about like empowering their, their own, their own uh, company uh, because they know that uh, today mastering technology is something absolutely essential uh, to, to, to get your project done in, in the way you want to be, to, to be done. I've got... Um... Final question for both of you. I uh, would really like to ask you what's next. And it doesn't matter if it means for you personally, what you, uh, what you know is coming up, what you're planning, but also what you wish would be the next thing. That's a big one. Let uh, Nicola start answering. <laughs> uh, what's, uh, what's next uh, in terms of computational design? I, I, I would just, uh, I know if it's really what's next, but uh, I'm just uh, I'm just encouraging a lot of architects to go check what's going on in other industries, aeromotive, auto, uh, automotive, aerospace, uh, and uh, high tech, uh, because it's really amazing to see how uh, challenges are very similar, uh, uh, you know, uh, when you compare uh, AEC industry to other industries, the need for automation, the need for uh, intelligent project managing around computational design topics is absolutely huge in automotive, aerospace, whatever. And uh, so, I'm, I, so this is this is for my part. What's next is uh, I would say you know architects just check out what's happening outside of, of of architecture because you might learn a lot and you might just add huge value to. Uh, See what's going on there. Mm, yeah, I, I can I say the same thing <laughs> because this is a common topic of our conversation with Nicola. So Nicola has been involved recently as a member of the steering committee in the master uh, design by data at the Col de Bon that uh, that you quickly mentioned Jan before, and this is a common uh, topic of our conversation with Nicola of uh, architect that. Uh, may have um, enormous impact uh, with their um, creative thinking, computational design thinking, et cetera, in other, um, 
uh, let's say field than architecture so if i need i mean my wish if i take this uh, this format to answer uh, is that uh, yeah maybe i'm wondering how we can uh, like uh, be less among architects and more with uh, other people. For me, what I'm recently saying a lot here at Volume is the, the perfect match for the next big uh, startup is uh, an architect plus uh, an entrepreneur um, to create something very big. I think that, that that's something I would like to see happen and maybe it's also what we are trying to do at Driven. I don't know. Maybe it's my unconscious that is coming up. But yeah, that's my wish for the next years. I would like to open this debate. Also, if somebody wants to ask something or say something from the audience. I uh, have something to say. Uh, just being for being on time, I don't want to make it this uh, conversation long. So I, I first I want to thank you all of you and also Matish if he is still listening to us. And maybe I might say uh, more being about open sources. It's it's in in one point it's nice, and because you know many students cannot reach all of the sources in 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 one time. Because you know, because of the sources and because of the country where they are living, so it's good if we have more sources and more discussion, more debates, and in online in YouTube. So I might say uh, you should do more online discussion to for the students. And thank you so much. More work for you, Jan. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. There is always yeah. more work for me. <laughs> no, it's it's really nice to it's really nice to hear that uh, this actually resonates. It was, I, I have to say that uh, throughout the week, I uh, I was doing my best to actually deliver some something valuable, and maybe my ambition was uh, a little bit to teach. But I have to say that for me, the greatest outcome is that I've learned a lot. And uh, that's because um, we had uh, a lot of great guests and we also had uh, people uh, following us just like you, Gizem, uh, giving, giving notes and comments that, that were on spot. And I actually had to, like many times when in the evening when I come home, I keep thinking about what we were talking about. And it helps a lot to, to sort uh, thoughts out and to think, a little bit deeper about what you do and what you should do and, and so on. So um, it is, these things seem to be very valuable uh, for, for, for the people who actually create the content as well. At least it, it is for me and I hope that it's for, for other ones as well. Mm. Francesco, uh, Nicolas, do you want to, to say something as a, as a final note in, in this debate because we already have Chris online. Um, awesome. Yeah, no, not really on my side, uh, Jan. Thank you very much. And really, uh, let's, let's, uh, let's have this conversation more often. I don't know. Let's talk about how to set up something. Yeah. Thank you very uh, much. for Very the... gladly. Th th thanks for having us. Hello, Chris, by the way. Hello. I will, I will change your name, actually. I, I realized I can do it for you. So, so I'm. <laughs> I have the power, so I, I will. Use. Yeah, I have the power. Uh, I'm the host of this event, so now your name is almost correct. I know it's not perfectly correct, but I don't have this umlaut um, um, key on my keyboard. So, thank you, Francesco. Thank ciao, you. Ciao, ciao. Thanks to you. Thanks, guys. Thanks to you guys. Oh, good. Uh, welcome, welcome, Chris. I will introduce you very briefly. Uh, sorry. I will introduce you very briefly, and then uh, I, I'm very happy to, to have you here. Um, Chris is an architect based in Vienna who has his own brand that is called Bewegende Architektur, which as far as I know, uh, my, my very cool German, uh, means that it's a moving architecture. Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs>
it's uh, very similar to what we are trying to achieve and you are achieving that. We first, um, for the very first time, we met at the meetup in 2015 in Bratislava and you were giving a speech about uh, your moving uh, robots, uh, robotic pieces that, that create space. And then we met uh, actually many times afterwards and, and many times we spoke. Uh, you were uh, one of the tutors at, at our robotic lab here in, in Bratislava. You were working um, uh, with Michael Schultes uh, and uh, a lot of your students on a project where you were making inflatable architectural pieces using, using the robot and then inflating the stuff and creating uh, spatial elements out of that. So um, my first well, you you can add something to it uh, in a combination with my first question. What have you been recently up to? Uh, yeah, nothing to add much. So basically, we are quite busy right now. Um, during Corona phases, uh, we have uh, thought that uh, two projects will not uh, continue. And uh, right now, we have tried to get different projects successfully and uh, the two projects that we have thought that stopped uh, started again. So right now we're in a huge hurry. Uh, it was uh, end of semester. Um, it was an interesting but uh, weird uh, experience to teach only uh, online. So it was not a new experience for me, but uh, it was um, a new experience to uh, do full uh, online uh, diplomas and uh, bachelor theses. So I personally miss a little bit, um, uh, uh, yeah, the 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 real space in in university. But actually, this that's is something it. that everybody is actually saying we miss real yes. life <laughs> a lot. You want to meet students and especially for diplomas, you know, the, the parents are there, the friends are there and it's not the same when you do this in a, in a go-to meeting, but yeah. But uh, maybe one thing to add, uh, as you described uh, the company, thank you very much. Uh, the idea beyond this uh, Bewegende is in Germany, this has two meanings. It's uh, somehow it's moving and the second meaning is that it's uh, touching you and this is an important uh, idea for, for us that we want to make. You can actually say that in English as well, that something is moving when yes, how impressive exactly. and, and touching. Yeah, but that's the update. Oh, so, so that's the only update to, to, to what, what I was saying. Okay. Um, uh, but now what, 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 what specifically have you been up to? I'm not, I don't really mean that uh, if you cannot say uh, what projects are you working on, uh, maybe maybe they are somehow uh, secret. Uh, but mainly, I was thinking of um, what is the the topic that you've been uh, exploring. What is the thing that you would like to to um, explore more, or research more, or maybe design more? Something something that that is the the crucial thing right now for you? What have you been up to? Ah, okay, sir. So you mean a more detailed, uh, 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 besides the introduction. Uh, yeah, basically, um, as we have posted a few months ago, uh, we are working on a stage set in uh, London uh, for AOE. This is a really cool uh, group of uh, two people basically that are doing awesome uh, performances. So the project um, that uh, we are still continuing, there has been uh, a little bit of, uh, uh, yeah, we have missed some time during the Corona and it was one of the projects that we were not really sure when it will continue, but actually that's an inflatable uh, stage set. Uh, that is going to interact with the audience and with um, uh, with uh, the dancers on on the stage. Um, for this project and of course also for other projects, we have uh, dived deeper into the uh, digital simulation of uh, inflatables. So the bullet 
uh, engine from uh, Blender is really uh, uh, has a huge update on, on this uh, topic. So you can make, uh, even if not uh, physically correct, but, but really uh, you can approximate how inflatables uh, are, are, are uh, yeah, or and if you inflate and deflate how, how they, the shapes do uh, behave. And this is a, a huge uh, step for us because we have done a lot of this stuff in Kangaroo and, and other of these uh, tools. And this is a way more, uh, uh, yeah, speedful and, and accurate uh, method, in my opinion. Uh, I'm writing an article on the impact of uh, Corona on architecture because uh, for me, it was quite interesting to see um, how uh, a lot of stuff has changed. So this is, but I don't think that's special. Every one of us is, is uh, I guess, uh, trying to consider what, what is really uh, happening with this. If you have such kind of crisis and what does it mean for architecture? Because basically we find out that a lot of architectural buildings that we are doing, uh, or not really used, you can do them digitally. So this is a thing that I'm really interested in. And uh, furthermore, we, yeah, we are due uh, basic, but really cool projects. In my opinion, we have another uh, art installation uh, for a customer. We have, have already uh, made some stuff. Uh, it's going to be a, a kinematic uh, art installation on the ceiling. And we do um, uh, two tables. Uh, this is also new for us. These are kinematic tables. So they do move, you know, that's our topic. Um, that's also interesting for us because that's, uh, yeah, a strong connection to craft. So in general, we have expanded in a, a lot of ways. We do have a multiple projects. We are working together more with other uh, other companies, which is a new experience for me because until now we have done everything in a quite, uh, yeah, on our own. So it's new to work together with way more uh, companies. But yeah, as an architect, we are familiar to it and we are heavily working on time management right now. But this, this seems to be an issue. Uh, do you also have the experience that you're? spending somehow too much time on, on online conferences. In the, in the previous blog with Francesco and Nicolas, we were actually saying how great it is, but at the same time you have to say it is great, but then uh, at the end of the day, you realize you, you just been on a phone all the time, all the day. Is that yeah. an issue? And that's true. So I would say that uh, uh, also the Distance learning on Technical University, it was awesomely managed from, from our informatics center. So uh, in a very quick time, all of the tools have been there to start out working. But in the end, I have to say, um, you're spending more time like sitting in a, 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 I'm missing the word, seminar room. Uh, or in a workshop because a lot of stuff, especially in, in architecture and when you're doing, uh, it sounds weird, but uh, especially when you're doing this um, uh, algorithmic architecture, generative design, it is good to sit next to each other and it is good to uh, take a pencil and make diagrams somehow to to get an overview of, of what's happening. And then the classical architectural uh, education, uh, of course, it is way easier if you have the plan in front of you, the model in front of you, and working without all this stuff. But I completely agree. Uh, I have the impression that if you have the possibility to talk to everyone anytime, so this is nothing new, but uh, then a lot of people are not really as prepared as if you would do a physical meeting. So I have the impression if you meet a person, then everyone is a little bit more focused and prepared and willing to nail down stuff. So, yeah. 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 <laughs> All right, let's go back to architecture and to yeah, um, 
to the main concept, to the core. My, my question for everybody today is what makes uh, the computational design special for you or what do you think is the one special crucial aspect of the computational design that makes it value, a valuable approach today? Why have you chosen that, chosen that over all the other possibilities? Uh, I'm not sure if I really have uh, chosen it. Uh, I started out with uh, computational design, I guess quite uh, early, but of course not early uh, in uh, compared to others, but uh, I was heavily uh, inspired uh, by the ideas of Michael Hansmeier to, that's where I really got into this algorithmic uh, design uh, I would make a di distinction between automating tasks with CAD and, and, and really trying to make uh, algorithmic uh, design and algorithmic architecture. But what um, fascinated me most in the works of, of Michael Hansmeier is um, and what he talked about it is that you, if you're working with uh, alg algorithms and if you're doing this simple switch and you have this butterfly effect of which you cannot really tell what is happening then you are in a state in which you cannot really tell is this uh, design that you came up with is it done by a machine is it done by human is it nature or is it uh, uh, techniques uh, this is what fascinated me that there is something beyond uh, the classical approaches of imagining an idea and uh, nailing it down to paper that you have something beyond it and something beyond uh, machine and human in which you cannot really tell where is it coming from and i also love the way uh, that is maybe on a very low basis but the same like you have build a robot and you see it moving the first time that that's really a, a magical moment this is really a touching moment and the same in in, in uh, algorithmic design or, or com computational design in general that it is evolving on its own and you're somehow a, a, a parent of what you have created but it's evolving on its own and you can give it the freedom to develop in a direction that is somehow surprising you every day uh, again that, that's what fascinated me or, or is still fascinating me uh, most in, in computational design. It seems like we are revolving around the same thing about the emergence that uh, Mateusz actually said that um, it seems to, to somehow start failing this notion and yeah. um, and it's hard to it's hard to achieve it in a, in a full-fledged way. Uh, then Francesco said that he actually likes the emergence. You, you said the same but there is one other thing that I really love um, that you said you you you're probably the first person that I that I met who actually admits that with the computational design it might not be the the human who is making the design, whereas yep. mostly we are trying to say it is always the human why way one way or another it's either the the human creating the uh, the algorithm and or, or it's the human having the idea and the computer helps that that's what people usually say, I, I tend to say the first thing that you are still creating the algorithm, but you are saying that there might be something that, that maybe the computer is one of the, the authors, maybe it's the nature. And the, the beautiful part is that you are actually embracing it. You actually like the fact that it's so unclear and, and it's so collaborative between different species. Um, I actually have to think about it a little bit more because this is a very strong notion. Not denying that, but embracing the fact. Yes, so uh, basically, I, I guess it's starting out in a very, very early stage. If you have Sigmund Freud and the idea of Umbehagen in culture, I guess there is a conflict between techniques and uh, uh, humanity in general. So I guess uh, humans have always been afraid of their own creations. And if you take, for example, uh, in uh, uh, this uh, 18, 19th, cent, 19th century where you have a train and the train was not allowed to drive faster than 30 kilometers per hour 
because if it would do, then you would not really know what is happening. You cannot stop it and you cannot uh, uh, take over control of it. And I think the same is, is if we talk about AI, I, I have the impression that, that we are in the same... So I have switched to AI, maybe that, that, that uh, was a wrong, uh, uh, a, a too huge step, but also in computational design. I guess a lot of designers uh, are afraid of losing control or losing uh, the possibilities to design and, and get, uh, getting lost of control. But if you take the AI topic and then maybe I make a little switch, I, I guess it's the same like the train that is not allowed to uh, drive faster than 30 kilometers because then it's out of control. We are afraid that we are losing control of AI, but in general, um, I guess that is, uh, it's, it's more about the fact in which context you see it. And uh, as a designer, uh, I guess every one of us is really going for the idea of computational design. But uh, after all, I always have or try to to have enough time that I do know, okay, I'm able to exit in a way that I can get back control, uh, especially in the design, uh, in, in the construction phases, because we are uh, building uh, merely area of our projects. And of course, there is one part in which you have to say, okay, uh, we have to make it uh, physical. And of course, that's where we are strongly asking the question how to uh, get control over the project. Um, yes, I'm not sure if this has been a clear answer, but yeah, I like the unclearness and I like the cloudiness of, of computational design and I like uh, the unexpected. Not in a way of glitch, but also in a way of uh, uh, ways of organizing uh, design that you would not came up with if you came from a traditional architectural thinking. Awesome. It seems like, I, I, I like the fact that we are all talking about the same stuff. Basically, we are yeah. just finding different words for the same thing. And um, and I like that it's, it's obvious from what background we are coming. So uh, you being, um, actually not, not, not being Austrian, but spending time in Vienna, uh, you mentioned uh, Sigmund Freud, which is something like uh, a Viennese should always do. and. Yeah. And I like the fact that it's so obvious that uh, what, what the background is and, uh, and the ideas are exactly the same. And I always love talking to you because that's, it's, it's somehow you, you're, you're saying exactly what I would like to say in, in different words and, and that's very enriching. Um, I've got um, one final question for you and uh, yes. hopefully it's going to be, uh, the answer is going to be a long one. Um, the question is short, what's next? And I don't mean just, um, uh, you, can, you can answer in any way. You can, you can say what's next for you, what's next for, for your work, what do you expect to happen next, or what do you wish that happens next? Whichever um, viewpoint works for you the best, just I'm curious. Yeah, what's, what, what's next? It's, uh, uh, in my opinion, we do have an historical chance we are right now in, I guess, and this is something very generic and maybe uh, something very obvious, but uh, Corona crisis has uh, shown us that um, we have to rethink architecture. And in my opinion, there is going to be a huge impact on architecture. I guess what's coming next in uh, general is that um, we uh, will be uh, faced with huge issues of uh, Corona in, in, in architecture in the next uh, few months and years. So you do have a lot of stores in the centers that uh, have been funded to create online uh, shops. Um, these people or a lot of those people will say, okay, I have a funded online shop from the government. So why do I need this uh, physical store in, in, in the city center? Why do I not just go for, for, for the online shop and I drop it, I save some money and, and why should I uh, invest money in, in something that I'm not really sure if, if this could happen again in a few months or in a few years. 
I guess the same for office buildings. A lot of uh, company leaders would say uh, these people that we have um, sent to the home office, maybe a lot of them can stay uh, there with you, say, space, and this will be a huge impact. I guess architecture has to be more flexible on this kind of, of uh, stuff. But in general, I guess that uh, Corona crisis is going to bring huge uh, difference, huge uh, re arrangement of stuff and I think that this is a very uh, big chance a lot of people are maybe afraid of these changes uh, especially in a political way uh, I guess the most uh, the baddest thing that can happen to us during the corona crisis is that everything stays the same uh, I, I would wish that there is going to be a change in a lot of levels uh, for me next um, uh, personally, uh, I started out doing more sports, uh, try to enjoy much more the way uh, of living, of uh, designing, uh, because right now I recognize that I'm way too busy in a lot of stuff. And uh, yeah, the goal for me is to rearrange a little bit my time and to get more focused on what I love to do, and that's kinematic architecture. Thank you. Um, let's open this discussion also for, for our participants. Is there anything that you would like to add or just join the discussion? Say something. I might have one. <laughs> so like, I, I don't know if it's a question or not, but maybe I am asking because I want to clarify. So the Christoph, when you are uh, answering the question about uh, why the AI is not uh, improvement itself today very much. So the uh, while answering this question, you said like losing, because some people are afraid of losing of control, right? Mm -hmm. You said this. So I might understand this if it's uh, using a train, like you give the example 30 kilometers. But I might not understand uh, in a thing of uh, the way of thinking in architecture way. Can you just a little bit elaborate what is this actually losing control? Why people are afraid of this? Mm, I guess... Um, in architecture in, way. In, in an architecture way. Maybe if I, I guess that's uh, a general in, in uh, computational design or, or when connected to AI that you may be not uh, able to somehow follow how uh, the, the computer is, is deciding. I guess it really depends on, on what algorithm you are using. If you're using tree learners, you can somehow re- uh, open the tree and find out what has been done and which um, uh, stages. But uh, maybe it's uh, not only the topic AI on its own because uh, you can of course uh, 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 see what, what, what has happened. Uh, I guess it's more the, the combination of big data in AI that you somehow uh, losing the overview. Maybe, maybe that's more, a more precise uh, description of it because if you're using the algorithms I guess of course it's possible to to uh, use them in a very controlled and precise way but in uh, general if if someone is not uh, deep into the topic or if someone is if you're talking about um, uh, a non uh, yeah people that are not using it and not familiar to it I guess that one of the biggest fear is is that uh, one is losing control over it. I'm not sure if the, this has been an answer to your question. Well, the thing is now, uh, I don't know if you whether watch or not Snowpiercer. Did you watch Snowpiercer? Sorry, no, I didn't. Uh, 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 so you should, you should really watch it. Uh, because, you know, when, after watching this movie, I, I mean, it also has series in, on, in oh, Netflix. It? Snow piece here. I don't know. I am. Maybe you write it down. Snow. Yeah, I will. I will write it. 
great. I don't know. I wrote uh, right or not. It might be something. So in that, it's actually like after uh, I watched this movie, I started to think what is actually control because are we really have this control even we are taught this control we have yes it's like after uh, watching this movie i just started to think about what is the actually notion of uh, having control for some on something so that's why i actually asked because you know it's it's complicated because sometimes we actually taught as an architect like we are kind of you know as a god we do things for human, but at the same time, I might start to think uh, in our on top of it, there's something control us at the mm. same time. It's like vice versa. Yeah, so that, that's just for asking. <laughs> I just ask. No, yeah, that's, that's definitely true. We, who is controlling? Uh, yeah, we are living in a society and we are influence of other people. And uh, of course, I guess everyone is is controlled or controlling, uh, but it's yeah, I guess a complex uh, network. I guess in AI, um, maybe we are way more controlled by it uh, right now. Maybe we did not even uh, recognize it, but I guess that's a, a very common uh, discussion. That of course you have uh, artificial intelligence ranked uh, Google results uh, based on, on uh, efficiency in the market. So basically what we are searching for, uh, that's not only a process that we are doing actively, but that is somehow delivered to us in a, a way that we even do not uh, know. But uh, yeah, maybe it's not only uh, I've, I've uh, told it, it's more the fear of, of losing the control. I guess the biggest problem in AI in general is that it is working as an amplifier, right? So uh, people that are afraid of specific mm-hmm. uh, things like losing control or like getting lost in this technology or uh, not being able to catch up, then AI is working like an amplifier that is making these uh, uh, sorts run way faster because it's cloudy. No one really knows how this develop is happening. And the other way around, if you have hopes like a company manager that uh, wants to increase his cold calling or, or efficiency, of course, for him, this is a huge hope where a lot of investment, a lot of money is flowing into. And I guess in history, uh, there has been different uh, situations like this that you have an uncertain technology no one really knows how it works and how to use it and then it's working like an, an amplifier of emotions for fear and for 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 uh, uh, hopes and in general uh, yeah it's like we have developed fire as humans but we have never found out how to uh, uh, deal with the unknown and to deal with the uh, something that we are not really able to recognize uh, to to describe. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was nice to meet you. <laughs> yeah. I I think I will uh, just mention this to to all our guests today. It would be super nice if you could uh, just post links to your uh, websites and works uh, under on Facebook under this video so that everybody can actually see what you are uh, doing and who you are. I will write that also in the group chat that we have, the private one. Uh, Chris, it was a pleasure to, to have you and um, I hope that we'll find a good occasion or good reason to call each other uh, even even without uh, having a conference or something. So yes. thank you very much. Um, yeah. It's about wishes. see you again for a beer in Bratislava. Um, cool, thank, thank you. you. And um, we'll move on. Um, we have another guest scheduled for one hour for, from now. Uh, but meanwhile, um, because um, it seems like uh, we are, uh, we've got some drop-offs also and, and uh, so on. Um, but we have uh, 
the two of you here, uh, Gizem, you've been uh, very active recently. May I uh, ask you the same three questions? What have you been up to? What is crucial for computational design and what's next? It's a good question. <laughs> well, actually, I was an expected question from my side, but anyway. Um, I think computational architecture, I mean, the, the also design part, it's not the new thing uh, we are talking. Like, it's, it's coming from, like, maybe 10 years, maybe 15 years ago. They started to discuss these things. Even maybe in, in the more. 60s. In the 60s, for yeah, yeah, even the 60s. So, but nowadays it's coming up more alive because maybe the global crisis. People are more think, thinking in a way it's like interwoven with the technology more. So, it's it's good if we are changing this thing in a positive way because it also has a negative side effect for the humanity, but. For sure, we will do the same thing in, in a good way to keep this thing for the humanity and for us to enjoy the life also. Because, you know, uh, sometimes uh, finding the, the, exploring the new things always gives excitement and this is kind of how we live. And for that reason, it's, it's good to keep updates for the contemporary life. And for my side, now for the what is next, it's actually like learning many tools. It's in my mind. <laughs> so finding the suitable one for myself. I hope I can find one and like keep going and improve myself and do something in the future. <laughs> Let's see. What is that you wish that happens next? Something that you wish uh, beyond your, your own uh, competence or control? Um, well, I, my wish, I, 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 I guess I have so many wish for myself to improve myself as an architect because you you know, like I am, I'm a fresher in my field. So I just, I just had one year experience working in, in professional life. So I had, I have so many ways and so I have so many things to learn. So I'm just like, uh, started to think more about how I can keep update myself in a good way and just to be happy also like it's very important person to be happy it's also because you know sometimes I, I, I saw people they're not really happy what they're doing actually even it's so excited what they are doing in my side but from the outside there seems like not happy what they're doing but I hope I will be the worst person who is always be happy what he what I am doing. So let's see. <laughs> That's a very hard task. Um, I would like yeah. to ask the same thing, uh, Akin. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Nice Hello. to finally see both of you <laughs> after you saw my face for a week. It was firstly it was great workshop for me. And we know each other actually with Giza. We are uh, friends from the bachelor. Okay. And, uh, and it's actually <laughs> not like we arranged this workshop. Like we didn't even talk about yes. <laughs> this workshop, and she registered this work, and we both registered the same workshop. It's a good one, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> That's not a coincidence. It all makes sense, right? Yeah. Yeah. We interest. <laughs> so, so what have you been up to? What is the crucial thing about computational design and what comes next? And I think uh, I'm thinking about next. It's so uh, nice opportunity for us, uh, for designer, and because we may make more ident identical production, it's, uh, we, are, uh, we are thinking how can solve this and we want we are thinking uh, so different things and it's the with the competitional i think it will be uh, it's it's showing uh, much more way for us uh, therefore sometimes it's hard and for me because uh, i was typical architecture student now in the master it's 
so I have so much opportunity and it's it's the, I think uh, learning in the uh, moving of life and we are always I I'm feeling sometimes I'm always doing experiments some tools and some design it's I think it's uh, designer arch and architects, not uh, technologists, uh, not sociologists or some things, but uh, it's the, we have to think about in for, we have to think uh, about for not maybe humanity, but for the uh, environmental. It's we have to look so much large uh, weave or light scape. And I think it's the opportunity competition designed for that. And it's the, okay. Uh, thank you both. Um, I'm now talking to Ryan, who is going to um, be our final guest of the entire workshop. He's scheduled for 45 minutes from now. The reason is that he's in the US and he's, well, it, it's the middle of the night for him. Uh, not even midnight, but it's something like uh, 3 a.m. or something, it's like, like some crazy time. But he seems to be, uh, he seems to be awake because he's answering my, uh, my messages. So maybe we can wait a little bit and maybe he can join us immediately. Yeah, and uh, if not, then then still uh, in 45 minutes uh, when he was originally scheduled, we should continue uh, with the last uh, final uh, debate. Meanwhile, I will just say where who, who is he and where do I know him from. Uh, when there was the first meetup that we organized in Bratislava in 2015, uh, I got a recommendation from uh, some professors or that there are some interesting people that I should invite and and Ryan was one of those people that, that I should invite, uh, recommended by uh, Peter Truma, uh, who is the one who um, in 2011 called me a weirdo from nowhere. Uh, he is a professor in Innsbruck and, and as far as I understand, Ryan was uh, his um, assistant at that time. And um, I believe that he is going to show some stuff as well, but uh, what when when he sent me his portfolio or some sort of uh, samples of his work, it was something so unusual, so so unexpected, something that exactly what we were talking about right now, because what he was doing, he was assembling his architecture uh, from uh, shapes that looked like inflated animals pandas and, and bears and whatever animals. And he just squished those inflated animals into, into forms that eventually created some sort of uh, architectural sculpture. And that was something that I really wanted to hear more about. So he became um, a guest of, of the first meetup uh, among uh, many other wonderful people. And um, he's a... Mm, He's a person that, that, that you cannot, um, cannot um, when he enters the room, you, you cannot avoid the fact that he, that he did. But um, eventually he, um, he seemed to, to like it in Bratislava so much that he came again in about uh, a month or two uh, for a vacation. And we met again and um, we, we had a good opportunity to, to talk a little bit more. And um, his opinions and views are, also very interesting and um, I, I thought that he could be a valuable addition to, to this um, uh, discussion. But hey there. Can you hear me? Hello, yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I like your setup here. It's amazing. Yeah, but yeah, it's a presidential setup. You know, you can see me like this and you can see me like that. Oh, you got it rigged so you can switch it off. I like it. Right? I like it a lot. Right? Very professional. I'm trying to be. What is it behind you? Is it pandas? Yeah, this is this is my panda. 
Uh huh. And, uh, uh, all right. Niece, this is my grand niece. <laughs> oh, all right. Yeah. So, it's oh, a God. very, it's a very pandemic background. Yes, yes. As a matter of fact, I was, I was running. A, I've been running a, um, a uh, salon every Saturday, which we call the pandemic, uh, pandemic salon, which is. Uh, <laughs> Uh, which it, it's a weird discreet conference basically which no one lets me publish so <laughs> which is the yeah I, I can imagine so where are you now i'm in texas um and is it now. is it 5 a.m is it 5 a.m oh it is 5 a.m here that's why i have the coffee going right now that's a huge sacrifice that you're making for us much no. appreciated of course, of course, anytime. Always enjoy it. Long time no see. We've seen each other in 2015 and 16. Yeah, yeah, when I was leaving. And didn't you meet my father? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah, we were just talking about it the other day, actually. It was awesome that you actually came back to Bratislava with your father and, and just spent a couple of days. I didn't really expect that. And you, unfortunately, I think you were there in the winter when the when it doesn't look so good, like all over Europe, it's kind of unpleasant. But now it's raining right now. But otherwise, it's a it's a nice place to to, to visit. Oh, I, I actually adore Bratislava. It's it's been <laughs> from your your uh, hosting me and then just going back the second time and then another trip I made over there uh, before I even met you. I I loved it, the city quite a bit. Okay. I'm I'm happy about that. That's you know maybe the city is not as perfect as as I advertise right now. Also, uh, this is not my hometown, like the original place where I come from. But uh, whenever we are inviting somebody, uh, we are always making sure they're having a good time and and uh, enjoy staying because then uh, then also the main reason why they came uh, is gets a little bit better. So the conference for me it was it, it was awesome, and and I hope it was nice for you as well. Yeah, and I can. I always remember your furry jacket. I can't ever forget <laughs> this thing. So the the this thing is, is that I had a period that at that time when I I found it really funny to to wear all sorts of, of fur coats. Uh, they were not like real fur, but some artificial, and people knew that, uh, and they kept actually bringing me different fur coats. So. Um, when I was when I was uh, hosting the conference, in between of the of the speeches and between of the speakers, I was wearing different fur coats each time because, well, first of all, it was really cold at that place, uh, and also I found it really funny at, at that time to, to wear those things. Also, do you remember there was this uh, a, a comic strip uh, drawn by by an artist about how to get to the place where the conference is? Oh yeah, yeah, I remember. It's fantastic. Yeah, I, I, I was I was showing that the other day, and also he drew me in in the fur coat because I had a, a photo of me in, in a fur coat, and he remembered. And just I was always the, the presenter in, in the fur coat. And I'm not doing that anymore, actually. Oh, it's a shame. It was no, it was just one winter thing. That was just that winter, and and that was it. Just you know. What's your new thing now? Do you have a Do you have a new thing? I don't know. No, should well, no. No, I Both don't. The cameras, you got your throne room right here. This is fantastic. Yeah, yeah it's, it's my throne. Yeah, okay. I'm sitting on a throne. That, that's what I do now. <laughs> no, but maybe you can have a suggestion, something that I can, like, do. I don't know. I, I, I actually saw that when you were talking to Manu, I always I like the pictures on the wall there, too. These were these fantastic. Two. Yes, these two. These yes. pictures. Well, right. actually, you, you know, it's... um. This place where, where we are sitting is, is our office and it's sort of a little co-working. And um, it was not really designed by us, but we liked it so much when we were looking for an office space. And it was designed uh, by filmmakers that call themselves filmmakers. That's their brand, actually, Filmari in, in, in Slovak. And anyway, so, so they made this uh, really nice looking place. And this is our meeting room uh, that they decorated. And the photos here, they are, uh, they are friends who are coming and, and collaborators. So it seems like before we came to this space, like three years ago, or I don't know, three years ago, they kept taking pictures of everybody coming here. So these are all the guests of this space from before we came in. And it kind of is a, is a nice decoration. 
Also, what you can see here, it's some acoustic panel, a little bit improvised that we use uh, because um, uh, there is a huge echo. And also we use this material. This is actually some textile, some, some fabric um, pieces. It's, it's, it's actually meshed and put into a panel that, that can be used as an insulation. So, so that's another thing that we have here. And another thing, there is a window and there is no, no glass in the window here. And it, it, it actually leads to a hallway. So we just um, filled it with boxes. I don't know if you can see that, but those are boxes with this, this is, uh, LED strips. These are uh, USB cables and project samples, power sources, and all sorts of gadgets that we are using for our projects. They are there. Now I'm revealing all the secrets here. That's fantastic. Enough. Enough about that. Let's talk about you. Ah, okay. So, what so, have so you been? It, what have you been up to? Updating. Well, well, let me. Uh, do you want me to show this? I got a little presentation that I can go ahead. Sure. Do that. And uh, it, it, I, I, I kind of, I added some stuff I usually don't show uh, at the end. So, um, I, I, I'll brush through. I mean, a lot of this stuff is is um, stuff you already know. So, like, um, but uh, here, here, can I share? Okay. Uh, no, I need to. I need to allow that. Uh, wait. Now you can. Now you okay. can. Sorry, while you start, I, I need to open my window because okay. I need yeah, to open my window. Yeah, I'm, I'm not in any rush. Need more coffee, anyways. Set. Okay. I'm back. I just, I've been. <laughs> My house is going through construction right now. We're redoing the uh, the thing here, bathrooms and the uh, tiling and everything. And uh, I'm I'm actually set up in my kitchen right now. <laughs> so <laughs> we can see that. We we only see the pandas. But the same yeah. is going on here. I was I was so mad that uh, there is so much background noise throughout the, the entire conference because they are uh, replacing the windows. We got really nice. Uh, wooden historical windows and they're replacing them with the cheapest plastic ones. Anyway, go ahead. You're, uh, no, you're I, mean, I know what you mean. Uh, yeah, that's where, yeah, we have a lot of, they put this plastic up for a sound barrier and it's like the thinnest thing. We but, cannot see that. It's, it's all pandas. Oh, uh, yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll switch off after this. Let me get through this. Okay. So, I mean, I, I'm, you know, as you know, probably I'm, I'm one of the discrete boys. So it's always going to start off like this, you know, um, let me, where's the full mode here. And it, in this one, it's, so I'm going to go through kind of uh, these three points, like the idea of automation and then, then going to how that kind of correlates to uh, fabric and kind of what that applies to what I'm doing currently. So, I mean, th this is the chart that we've probably seen before, you know, the kind of uh, increase in automation since um, uh, it's, um, from 2019 and where it's kind of going to progress in the future and our, our really need to address it. And, um, of course, that that's, you know, that's this image, you know, uh, automation classically in the, the kind of car industry and using these robots in order to uh, build these cars. Um, but it's also, of course, Amazon. So we're seeing it in a kind of different method uh, with boxes, you know, which is in a certain way a, a folded kind of textile to a certain degree, um, at least the way I like to look at it. Um, and, and this is a real model that I really want to look at uh, to address automation um, in the future of something that I don't think is really addressed uh, directly um, as much. I think it, it's certainly starting to get there. And I'll, I'll point of a couple points to that and we're starting to see sewing factories starting to look like this so you have these these new machines i, I used to date this uh girl who worked for uh, polo ralph lauren in new york and and she had a uh a computerized sewing machine and she would never let me touch it even though i had a a, a 3d printer maybe that has something to do with my obsession with fabric i don't know but uh, and what the most interesting thing that I found out at that moment was that uh, unlike just a 3D printer head, these sewing machines, they have 128 heads and, they, and they, you can do all kinds of things with this. 
and you can start to see that kind of technology going into like um, you see it at Pier Nine over like Autodesk in San Francisco. They have new machines that are look they're printing in multiple heads and stuff like that. Very similar to what they're doing with sewing machines already. But this is kind of the new image of the the sewing factory, and and. You also see it in the prisons in Japan. They have these new automated sewing factories for the prisoners. It's really horrible that this is where it's at, but I mean, certainly we can start to see it coming out that in the, the sewing machines are getting more drastic and more automated. And you're starting to see machines like this that do these processes that were really hard to do by hand, but now they're, they're rotating, they're computerized. It's, it's like a sewing CNC but for certain techniques. Um, and I thought this was really funny because the, these, uh, these kind of machines are made to make the PPE, uh, but in a sense that they're robots too, you have these kind of systems that produce these things. I, I worked on several so, uh, product development with patents and stuff and you know, working with like pharmaceutical machines, whole buildings that kind of produce an object, uh, which is super interesting to me. Um, and, you know, this is probably the most, uh, one of the mo more uh, direct um, views of that. This is the SODU. It's a, a kind of robot sewing rig that uh, will uh, automate the process of e even handing the, the fabric to the sewing machine. I, it's kind of funny that this, this sewing machine is really a, just a brother sewing machine. It's not really like one of these high tech ones. But I think it, it, this is this is a possibilities of a kind of future. Of it. And certainly, this is a sad story. I was just talking to someone about that this the other day, the Electroloom, uh, which I, I guess last year they they kind of collapsed and they they don't exist anymore. But you know, they were producing these um, printed fabrics. Certainly, this is getting out of the kind of sewing directly. This is uh, because. There's no stitches really here. It's printed all in once, but it's still fabric and it's still kind of in my purview. Um, but you know, this is the classic machine you see in these kind of automated sewing factories. These these are made by this one specifically is the uh, Air Economy. It's uh, it's just like the Gerber's. Gerber's one of the most famous um, uh, sewing CNCs. Uh, they make these big machines and they they print out these whole bunch of panels at once. I mean, it really is the kind of streamlined process instead of just cutting those things by hand anymore. And then, you know, the software does that too. It has, it's very much like we pack uh, laser cuts, that, but they have a, a, a pretty well robust system for doing this. This is Lectra's cut fit um, nesting fabric application. It, uh, and there's a whole bunch of these that, that pack things better than any of our grasshopper scripts and stuff like that. I mean, it's oh, and even more interesting, they have some of them that you can scan in like leathers and different, um, uh, it, it, you know, fake leather <laughs> or uh, what have you um, in order to uh, analyze the irregular shape and, and to pack in on these irregular shapes. So it's not just the kind of uh, square units we use in laser cutting, you can actually um, optimize the best pieces. I mean, certainly they use this in the, the sh shoe companies and stuff like that. As a matter of fact, sh shoe software is a whole different thing. I can have a whole lecture on sushi software as well. Um, and, and we're seeing that going into objects like, you know, in the automotive, in the bottom right, you can see one of these optimized pieces of leather on the bottom right. You see how they've kind of cut out the best pieces and where they kind of go optimize that production for this, this kind of unit on the left, you know, but I think this is very architecturally and more, more suited to me. And this also goes into aerospace, Gerber, Gerber's applications in Optitex and Lectra basically have two fronts. It's the fashion industry and then aerospace, you know, that's the two sides of it. And it's funny, I've even tried to talk to them into like, you know, partnering with me or something on, on uh, architecture stuff. And the, the, they just have too much business already and they, they think I'm annoying. <laughs> I'm gonna keep trying though, I keep trying. Um, but anyway, so that gets us to fabric. And so I've been working with fabric quite a long time. And it really, it, this, this is really what I'm interested in. The idea that you can take one, one piece of material and fold it into something else. 
it's not just the sewing technique, it's the kind of folding into something else. And, you know, and the analogness of this is, is pretty interesting. It doesn't have to be computationalized. It can be something you can do by hand, but in, it, in its base essence, the folding in technique of it is like origami or something like that. And it has a, it has a very computational method you know, just by, you know, cutting the sock, you know, sewing these kind of things together. I mean, th these are course oriented for the times we're in right now. Uh, but yeah, I, anyhow, it's, but it, my real interest is in impregs. So uh, not just in fabrics. So uh, fabric materials that have uh, a impregnated um, uh, substructure that that will do, do several things to it, like uh, neoprenes, you know, have waterproofing. Uh, we have uh, other ones that, that have catalyst in them that actually change the materiality of the fabric over time and then, um, and, and then turn it into something else. So you can inflate things and harden them and create these shapes. And I'm gonna go over a couple of these, you know, and, and these come in a couple different things. Like the one on the left is a toe, which is kind of a, a nylon material that you, it, it's impregnated with resins. And, um, and then you see it in the fabric kind of oriented thing on the, on the right. Uh, and, and these are the impregs. These are the two major ones I look at impregnated carbon fiber with resins and then concrete cloth on the right. Both of these are really what I, I'm focused my attention on. We're, we're, we're in arguments with both companies <laughs> to, <laughs> to give us some funding. Um, but you also see it in uh, Kevlar. Kevlar fabrics um, have um, an impreg in them as well. Um, that what makes them uh, like, and of course I'm in Texas, so I'm talking about bullets, right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. But um, not, I'm not a gun fan at all, even though I am in Texas. But but uh, when I was at SciArc, I was, uh, we, we were sponsored by North Sales and we got to see some of the factory stuff. This is North Sales factory. They use impregs in their, in their sailboats. The, so it's a, it's a carbon fiber and then they, they either, uh, it's either pre-impregged or they layer it up with resins and they create these kind of shells. Um, not the loose sails, the, these are those high speed ones they race up the, uh, the Atlantic Ocean. You know? But you also see it in, in more advanced fabrics lab at, at NASA. Uh, these materials are used on, um, to protect against um, different kind of conditions, increase the R value of, uh, of kind of soft body materials. Um, but yeah, th this is this is the fun stuff. You know, the concrete uh, canvas can kind of be oriented in a whole bunch of different ways, and then hardened on spot. Of course, like this is why they don't want to sponsor me because when when you harden one of these things, they <laughs> they weigh a ton, and they want me to have like a crane on site or something to move it off. They're not going to be responsible. But you know, like the, these these these. Um, these military bunkers that they kind of deploy, these things are just kind of taken out on site, they're inflated, and then they just spray them with water in their permanent structures. You can walk on the roof of these things, it's quite amazing. And so this really is where my, my, my interest is focused, um, getting to something like this and how it can be uh, associated with an architecture. Um, and see the interiors for these, I mean, they come like this, the doors are already attached, you just inflate these things. It's it's so amazing. Uh, I I really am interested in this. But you, you see research and development. These are some artists that are, are using that same material and using the sewing technique and and creating these units. Just I mean, very it's it's very you know blunt object you know, but it's working. You know, you just kind of fold it down and it holds up the surface because this stuff gets hard as a rock. It's it is concrete, you know, and you get these beautiful objects out of it. You can make chairs. Um, I don't know how it would, would be comfortable. It looks like a pillow, but I feel like my my butt would hurt sitting on this thing. It's it's such a hard object, you know. Uh, but anyways, that brings us to architecture. I mean, certainly uh, uh, it's not a direct path, but I mean, we are looking at furniture at the end of that and, and kind of build structures. And let, I'm just going to kind of take you on a path of how I got to looking at this stuff and, and investigating it. I mean, certainly architecture, when we think about fabrics, it's all tensile. I mean, it, it, it's, it blows my mind at how much architecture does not address 
inflatables or anything like it. But I mean, I guess in a certain level, a, a bounce house is all that you can think of as an inflatable. And by the way, I love bounce house companies. I'm, I'm trying, I have one friend that has one. I'm really trying to get him on board, but uh, he, he is, he's kind of a fun guy. Do you want him to produce, uh, do you want to design bounce houses for, for him or do you want them to start producing something yours? Yes. Yeah, which, yeah which I want them. Show? I I want to use their shop to produce something for me. <laughs> I'm not doing bounce houses. I thought so. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. But it, what what you find most of the time, even in in the fashion industry and in, in the bounce house industry, for that matter, uh, most of these people aren't using computational techniques. Yeah. It's all done by hand, and that you know that's that's kind of what we, me and my friend, haven't really got involved because they just have they just have this kind of analog industrial sewer that really doesn't do the trick you know we need we need computation we need specificity on the on the cuts and cutting them by hand sometimes doesn't work i mean in, in a sense like the whole industry is i mean if you ever watch like uh one of these uh clothing fashion shows right they're they're just cutting in by hand they leave it kind of ragged until later I mean, it's pretty much the standard, but um, but at the high end, like if you look at um, like Versace and stuff like that, when when they're producing like a, a lot of those products uh, at a high level, they're using some of these techniques I'm I'm talking about. But yeah, so he, here's more of the architecture stuff we're used to. Uh, there's Denver, the Denver Airport, and I forget what this artist is on the right, but it's usually either hung. Or tensile, but um, but that got me to this point. Uh, I was uh, I had a studio with Nanako Umoto, and we were uh, we were just having fun. Honestly, I was I was using using uh, memory foam, so we were kind of in the textile world. And she really wanted me to start to wrap things, and so I, I started wrapping things with these kind of skins. And that, that, you know, led to this building, which was, um, which was basically this kind of wrapped piece. Then, then, then it was wrapped with the skin to be, make an enclosure. Um, but one thing I started seeing is the objects, uh, what it, it was subject, this, the, the wrap, the bag was subject to whatever it was around, you know, it, it wasn't independent of itself. And so that started to change a little bit. Like with this project, I started putting the, the bag on the kind of a, a um, an equal level as all the other parts. Um, and so like here, like basically the, the two bears, oh, uh, well actually, so the, the bears and the bag were kind of equal. They did not, the, the bear wasn't pressuring the bag to do anything and it was kind of independent of that interiority you know of course that's that that independence in meta space started to form the floor plates but you know it's still it's still in some way was still subject to the interiority of everything um and and that further moved on into uh some work i did at tom wiscombe's uh, office this is the ghost house um as you can see on the left it's obvious that something's inside of it you know, and that and that object inside uh, still dominated its ability to be independent on its own. You know, uh, even though in this case this is this is a quite nice piece, and I still enjoy uh, the kind of aspects of this. And this this sort of thing came from looking at like Bart Hess and uh, mutations. I don't know if you know that piece, but it's basically him. You know, and Bart Hess has taken this kind of uh, 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 rubber and wrapped it around these models and you it's kind of uh, defamiliarizing the person inside into these kind of new shapes it's kind of fascinating uh, but yeah as you see here um, e even when you pop the bag into kind of a different materiality it's still very subject to that box in the inside um, and so um, my thesis at SciArc, uh, leaving there, was really about uh, uh, making the object independent of the objects inside of it, you know, and letting it, it be a kind of 
in, in, in a certain way discreet, but not in the sense we talk today. It, it was independent, it was a singular object, but it wasn't repetitive, it wasn't the same thing, and there wasn't kind of a sustainable automation built behind it. But those kind of ideas were starting from here. And it was big, you know, this was the size of a building. It wasn't dealing with anything that was uh, manageable, sustainable, or even able to be automated. It was just about the space. It was a kind of formalism move. And any, any kind of uh, deterioration from the whole was done with sewing and stitching, as you can kind of see on the roof here. Um, but this was the question that was really coming up in my head. Like, um, there's an idea of like, what is familiar to us and, and the, the animals to a certain degree were looking at like childlike behaviors and childlike familiarities that everyone can notice. And I was really looking back to where that was and how that related to our childlike nature and architecture to look at the objects that we first are like presented with, right? Which is like the Maison Domino for a lot of us. Like it was that first one, you know, that really made sense into modernism, right? And it, it really comes from like Donnie Win Winnicott wrote this book, uh, Playing in Reality. And he talks about this period of childlike behavior um, that you look at, at specifically an elephant and a, a bear as as a mother-like figure it's not even a it's not even toy it's it's this kind of almost genetic familiarity to these objects that you accept as your own and it, it by the time you're like three months old it's already gone but it's this little tiny period in the beginning and i have no idea why say like a Canadian child or American or even a, a, a South American child would look at an elephant and understand it as a mother because where did they see an elephant? Or like, where did their family members see it? I, I don't know. It, it's a weird thing to think about, but I also relate it. I, I, um, there's, a, there's a whole conversation about uh, early, early Indo-European and Asian cultures and how you look at the language of what mother and dad is, and it's very similar across the board. Like, and so these words are something that's like in the base familiarity as us as humans. And I argue that that same thing is in, in object recognition. I think that's something there. And, and then Candy Valley certainly is, is kind of a, a, um, a backing of that. You know, when we see a robot that is too human, it does look like a corpse and so we kind of back away and that's that 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 sensibility also can be looked at this this uptick of that of human likeness and where where a stuffed animal has a familiarity that we accept to a certain level um it's it's kind of a strange thing but of course you have these uh but uh i'm gonna mispronounce that Baraku puppets, which are these like, very strange. I mean, you're, you're over in, in Bratislava. I mean, the, the Czech puppetry stuff is not very far away from you. So, I mean, some of that stuff can get very strange as well. There is uh, puppetry over here as well. Yeah. But, <laughs> but, but I had to look, uh, look up the Bunraku uh, puppet now. It, yeah. It, it's, it's really interesting. I, I'm a big fan, fan of, I'm going to mispronounce his name, uh, Jans van Meer, or, um, yeah, how do, how do I say? Uh, yeah, he, oh, and yeah. also uh, Brothers Quay, they, they both come from the area you're in. Uh, and then there's another current lady. She's, uh, she did a, a movie called Blood and Strings. Um, I, I'm big, I, I love that kind of work. Anyways, but off, the, off subject, but uh, yeah. And so that, that comes to like that same, readings started getting me investigate other people talking about that stuff and certainly mike kelly was one of those um his work uh, especially with this piece uh which was first displayed in cologne uh it's called the constellations and it's got another name too a, a longer name I, I forget um but it was really the idea of taking these these units and and these soft body familiars and really, when you populate them so much, they become this kind of whole, and the whole kind of defamiliarizes the single unit. But yet, when you get close, 
there's a familiarity of that one, you know, and so there's that there's that childlike behavior at the at the 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 brick, and then there's something else happening at the hole. And so that's kind of the interest I was looking at. It's kind of how 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 do we get that same sensibility in architecture? And uh, I, I saw this piece by Tristan Lowe on the right, and I thought it was, I actually I had a long conversation with him, and how the association of, of Moby Dick to this kind of large unit was really the, the kind of familiarity of Western culture that he was kind of hitting on, and, and the softness and the ability for that thing to, to occupy an architectural space and actually be something that presses against the human impresses against the person viewing it so you I, I think this is not the best one there's some other ones where the 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 space that he's he's put the whale in is so small that you you have to kind of you you really are fighting with it to get around the space it's, it's quite amazing and so I, I associated that to my not the the panda piece i i was doing at the time and how the panda piece really wanted to perform uh in, in the degree that the whale was. And I had done a couple pieces that were still in the scale. Um, certainly the one behind me was still in the, uh, a slightly smaller scale than the, the, um, the thesis project, but starting to, to move away from the idea of the large pieces. Um, but, and so that brought me directly to architecture. And I always have to do this because my friends do it. So like Greg Lynn is the continuous surface and we, we've been pushing against this in the discrete quite heavily. Jill's always makes this argument that the discrete is, it needs to be straightened and it becomes these, these, uh, these sticks that are, de uh, that are discrete that, that make up that thing. And, it's, and this is in, in essence more computational because of, of how, how it's a repeated unit, almost like bits and bytes. And Manu makes the same point by saying that you could, you, instead of using something that's straight, you could use something like bamboo and, and occupy that, in that same digital unit, right? And I said, well, you know, pandas like bamboo. So my, mine is this like plushy animal that takes up that same occupation, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and so I started doing these units. These are these are these little soft bodies that really had no constraints. That were just you know really imitating the same things that that we all were doing in the discrete at the time. And then I started using and seeing how these things could connect in different ways and how different animals work. I started building up a menagerie. The one on the left is uh, an octopus that's been kind of sewn together through his kind of leg technique. The one on the right is a squid, so they kind of relate to each other in the kind of oceanic sense. And, and the way they kind of attach to each other, their connections are very similar. Um, and the panda, you know, I was looking at how the panda could, could stack and how he could, he could occupy and, and become more, more brick-like, how he can become a column. Also, here's a koala, and the, and as you can see through these these pieces, they start to react differently. The the way they interconnect, dependent on on their their connections and their kind of appendages, they do different things. They perform differently, and also their texture, like the difference between putting the black and white and just the the solid color. It's certainly an argument in Malevich, you know, which is which the figure ground opposed to the, the solid white, the white, off white. But I really wanted to get back to the idea of making a, a whole unit. You know, how could this formulate into a whole instead of the, just these kind of random aggregates, uh, which doesn't really do anything for you. Yes, they may create these kind of meta spaces in between, but I really wanted to like really get control of the idea. And that these are everything from Lady Gaga to this is a girl at an art gallery in, in New York. I forget what the, the similar one was. But and so I said, hey, look, okay, so let's formulate. Everybody was doing chairs. They were doing the voxel chair. So I said, uh, hey, this is my voxel chair. This is my panda chair. Like how do these things kind of sit together? How we could, how we could wrap them? How could we do a table? 
like this is like whales that make a table um or how could we start to formulate a, a, a couch you know and then uh and then i started doing these proposals for art pieces in texas this is a proposal for uh here in uh, keller um uh this was kind of a joke one uh, there was like four others that had similar things but this is the the funniest one i always show it and it really like the idea this came from like Ai Weiwei and the chairs also that 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 piece in spain with all the chairs kind of dropped in the in the alleyway but um showing how like even a chair as an object of familiarity can be kind of jokingly put into these different connections and then make these bundles and therefore make a kind of piece on the right um, and, and, you know, in this case, I was using a texture to uh, to play that kind of figure ground game, very much panda-like, as you can see, there's a kind of theme of panda going through everything. <laughs> but, um, and then I, I said, you know, well, well, let's get more serious. Uh, let, let's look at these connections uh, a little more um, directly and start formulating these new ones and looking at how these start to formulate housing units. Um, and we did a series of these of different animals. Uh, and then we were looking at how we did these in buildings. These are kind of stacked. Uh, and then here's the, the panda uh, the panda one you see behind me, like really looking at the idea that not only was it using this technique, but it was also giving a familiarity of say Mise um, and, and getting into the conversation of how these things could start to formulate floors and walls and stairs. And like this one was a, a kind of look at how we do the Savoy, the kind of how the familiarity between the two kind of dissolves, but still stays there a bit um, and how you, you work through these ideas. And that led to the discrete, the, the piece in the discrete um, uh, AD uh, and how a panda could like start to formulate floors and, and beams and columns and how that related to John Haydock's uh, Texas house. So it, like a familiar uh, one to me and maybe not everyone else, but uh, just trying to grab onto that kind of familiar building besides the Mies or the, the Le Corbusier, you know, the Maison Domino. And how that kind of formulates directly into the, the plans and in a fuzzy way. It's not, in the, it's not exact, but it's, it's, it's got a bit of its familiarity there um, in every floor. And then that kind of ending in this kind of building. And so since then, there's been a lot of different things that have happened. Um, that this was like, uh, we, we finished this like three years, three years ago. Uh, and I did an exhibit here. Um, I got asked to do this gallery and we basically took the whole gallery and unwrapped it flat and created these kind of line textures that went through the whole thing. Um, we also did these animals that kind of wrapped up the wall that were independent of the system of the floor. Um, and then they got projected on in the projections. I think this is by Mateus Del Campo. And then this other piece over here is from me, the projections. And then that became this whole entire space. And, it, and this, this whale in the center was kind of made the same way, even though he's not fabric, he's, he's made very similar. He's laid flat, he's made out of one material, uh, he, and he's sewn together with, with um, um, zip ties. Excuse me, my brain, it's early. Um, and then that's kind of progressed into a couple other exhibits. We did a, a soft, uh, we did a discrete familiar, uh, the familiars exhibit here um, with not just me, but uh, also a couple of the other guys with Jills and, and Manu and, and you see the whale, he started traveling a little bit. Molly did this, this column right here and my friend uh, Ben Warwash did these uh, piece brick palm trees. Um, oh, oops, that's the wrong way. But he also traveled a little more. This is him uh, actually where he currently stands, uh, which is in front of this, this art gallery here in Texas. Um, and then more recently, this, uh, we did a uh, workshop in Graz where we were really trying to uh, formulate how we started making these 
and stacking these things. And so this is one of the students. She did these wasp and, and also looking at other types of animals, ones that we weren't really looking at before um, and, and really looking at really primitives to start to organize the space. Same here, Th this guy, he was doing a, a, a cat and I, or what is it, fox of, fox of six tails or something, a fox of nine tails, something like that. I, I, it, was, it was cool, he wanted to do it. So this one, this one had six, we said nine was gonna be just too much, but it came out beautifully. I mean, so these are some of his, his billion shots, but then they actually made these things. So they made these little parts. There's about 20 of these and they're building some uh, wooden structures that these things are gonna kind of occupy. And here's kind of the stack of those things. Um, yeah. And so that's where, where I am today. You know, that's, that's the journey. All right. That, that's the answer to what have you been up to. I, mm -hmm. I, I want to say that you're clearly well anchored in the, in, in the architectural discourse and in, in the references and, uh, and, and the knowledge education. And then obviously at a certain point you just went rogue and completely crazy and, and, and here you are, uh, pandas and, and whales and squids. <laughs> um, I'm going to, uh, let's switch to a conversation now. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask you, um, well, um, two crucial questions. One is that what, may, what, what do you think is the, the main thing about the computational design? Why do you think that, does it, is it any different from, from any other approach? And if it is, wh why did you actually go to this direction? That's a very interesting question. Um, I mean, certainly there's a, there's a, there's a, a past that's taken me there. Um, I, I, was, I was in computation before architecture uh, in product development. Um, but that certainly that's not it. Uh, I, I think computation is something that that is that rationalizes itself to the real world, and certainly math, like just like math, is in the real world, and it, its use to create things uh, creates an ease that sometimes isn't available with with the tools that you're given us. I mean, certainly there's something nostalgic about, you know, cutting something by hand, but precision uh, is certainly um, needed. And, and in order to get there, when you start to use precision, it enables you to create more. And, and then certainly that's what computation gives me. It, it, if I can be, highly precise um, to produce something. For instance, I do jewelry design as well. And, and in order to produce uh, like a, a mold, it is certainly much easier for me to create my bevels and stuff like that uh, with a computer and then imprint a, a lost wax mold than it is to try to formulate that stuff by beating metal. Um, it, it's, it's precision, it's speed. Um, and then, I mean, once you get those down and you, you have stuff like the discrete, like with the idea, really what discrete for me shows is that at a, a, a purely a formal statement, it creates more um, variation and you're able to look at more variation quicker than if if you sat here and did this by hand and in, in certain levels it's almost impossible to do some of these things by hand despite all my old mentors telling me that they could carve anything out of uh, out of hand by hand um i've seen them try they can't do it <laughs> so I, I don't did that answer your question sure um I would like to open the, this discussion. We also have uh, some participants of this uh, debate. So if there's anything you would like to add or ask, uh, think about it now and then I will ask you again. 
And my final official question um, is what's next? And you can see this question in, in different perspectives. You can talk about stuff that is next for you, uh, stuff that you expect to be next for everybody and stuff that you wish that was next. What's next? Mm, what's next? I mean, it, certainly this work has has a progression that hasn't been realized yet. Um, and there's some work I haven't shown uh, with it specifically. With the concrete cloth and stuff, there's some column work we've been working on, um, which, you know, will eventually get done. It's a slow process of working with new materials and the discovery of what we can do with those new materials. Uh, and that works continue to progress. And I have another, I have other hats, you know, I, I've worked in the film industry and, um, and uh, uh, certainly have been involved in narrative most of my whole life. I mean, I was 12 years with a firm that our focus was on existentialism and narrative uh, coming from the, the Haydukian worlds and, and stuff like that. And I, I'm still trying to formulate how I bring that stuff back into my work. I mean, it's, it's where I come from. I was originally in philosophy and literature be, before architecture. And I'd like to bring that back in the work. Um, I just don't want it to muddy the work. Someone was just telling me like why I don't show that stuff. I mean, I showed it to you when I was in Bratislava a little bit, um, but but I, I've been been kind of walking away from it. And, because I don't really know how to, to link it. Like for instance, uh, I wrote two papers last year, one for the discrete and, and then another one for Fresh Meats Journal. The Fresh Meats Journal has nothing to do with the discrete. It, it is, it was, um, it's a really great article. It's called Theories and Manifestos. It's, uh, it's basically, have you ever seen um, uh, Coffee and Cigarettes? It's a ripoff of the scene uh, between uh, Tom Waits and uh, Iggy Pop. And I rewrote it for Architecture Meets Postmodernism in a bar in Texas. And, <laughs> but I mean, and certainly that comes directly from my involvement with my mentors, like Roger Kana writing Hotel, uh, Hotel Architecture. He was my partner for 12 years, uh, along with John Maruschak. And that kind of sensibility of writing architecture theory through poetry or a different form of writing that's not typical comes directly from that. And that's why it kind of eases with me. And I haven't really figured out how to associate that with my discrete work. And I would like that to happen. Uh, I just haven't done it. So I think that for me is what my next is, is figuring out that dichotomy. Is that a good answer? It is a good answer. It's it's a personal answer, mm -hmm. and I know the I know the struggle when you get um, two lines that you're developing in, and you really want them to to merge at a certain point, and sometimes somehow it's not easy. Yeah, um, I mean, it's even like I'm also a painter. Like uh, I can't even see that. Can you? No, we can't see it. Oh, you probably on. have to switch off the the background. Where is that button? Where is it I don't know. Oh, it's over here. I, I think it's in the video or some, somewhere. Here it is. You can see my, here we go. So yeah, I mean like my other, other hat is, this is my kitchen. <laughs> this is like, th this is a completely different situation now. Yes. <laughs> like that's, that's so strange. I it's thought th there is a wall behind you and it's not, I, I mean, I'm so confused. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. She has the painting. I mean, so like, this is my work. Like I do these, these sorts of paintings. Uh, this is a big three by three, you know, and it doesn't relate at all, at all. You know, and, and, and I mean, maybe the early work because I mean, way early I used to be like, you know, lines and parametricism and continuous surfaces. I think we all did it one time, you know? And so like, I don't know, I mean like, there's so many different, and then of course, like the pandas right here, like here's the, here's one of the models, right? He's a, he's like a big panda. It's like sitting on my desk. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you wear all these hats and you wonder how, how to get them together. 
you know, I, I, I spent so many years, you know, writing narrative into architecture. And now I find it so unimportant, but I wish it was important to me. I, I guess the only thing I could hold is these little like kind of narrative. It's like the, the familiar is a, a kind of narrative to me. It, it, it's banal and that's what I like about it, that it gets a narrative that I don't have to tell to somebody because I find telling a narrative at all just is it, it, like, if I, if I said to you, hey, Alice in Wonderland, all you're gonna be doing is looking for Alice in Wonderland and it ruins the painting, you know? And so like, if I tell you untitled number three, I'm not, I'm not trying to control you at all. You're making your own decisions and so the use of narrative in my architectural work, I, no one ever sees Alice in Wonderland. So like, why, I mean, like, it's great to do it internally. It's a great process. Like, oh, you, you, you know, you get a poem, you, you, you use it as a kind of direction. You know, yeah, I did that for years. I mean, it was, it was Roger writing something me modeling it, John splattering paint on it. And that kind of went through that circle, you know, and it was fun for many years. We won a bunch of competitions. I mean, look, look at, I don't know if you ever saw the, the storefront archi architecture project where we read the White House. Yeah, that thing's wild. We won first prize, we were in times and that, that's whole the whole firm started that way. And I mean, but it, it's, it's out to lunch. I mean, it was always out to lunch. It's high, high level existentialism with postmodern references from here to the 1920s, you know? So uh, it's, I don't know, I don't know. All right, let's, uh, let's open this discussion uh, to, um, yeah, to, to our participants. Is there anything you would like to say or, or, or uh, command, ask? Yeah, I can say thank you for this presentation. It was so funny and so good. And I, it's just my opinion. And when when I see these pandas, and I remember it's uh, Dutch graphic artist M. C. Escher, and I just remember uh, him. And he was also uh, playing with birds, fish, reptiles, and it's. I just remember it's like 3D <laughs> ashes. It's, it's so, it, it was it, it was my opinion, but and I'm curious about, have you ever in, inspired him? Oh, Escher? Oh, certainly. When I was growing up, my, um, so my, my father's a huge fan. And when I was growing up, uh, when I was really young, I was obsessed with dragons. And I used to draw dragons all the time. And in my room, there was, a, a, it's here somewhere too. Uh, there's a, there was an Escher of a dragon that was like crawling out of the paper onto the ink pad and then crawling back in, of course. They always looped around in the Eschers, right? And, and so this is something I grew up with. And my dad had something similar in his office. It was like a, a toy. So Escher was always something around the house. And, and you know, maybe, maybe, and maybe that's it. Maybe there was a little of that that came into the work later too, because it's certainly the pattern making, right? There's something there. Uh, you know, I, I'm quite a fan. You know, I I, I also like, I, it doesn't really relate to my work, but I do show students like, have you ever seen the Manimal uh, photos? There's this this guy, this artist yeah. who does these like chimeras, which it's like a human mixed with, with like yeah. a bird. And you know what I'm talking about, Jan? No, I actually don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah they're, they're, they're fantastic. And, and they're, they're these great images. If you haven't seen them, just search Manimal. I think the guy's name is Chris. The artist is Chris something. I, I, I don't remember exactly. But they're, they're really great. And, and it's the argument it, for those is like this kind of chimera. So it's like a mixture of a couple of different animals. I mean, certainly I worked with that some. And that turned into like Frankenstein. So it became like a panda with a, with a cat tail, you know? <laughs> so, but you know, I, I had a friend of mine who was like, oh, don't hurt the panda. It has to still be a panda. 
Like, so it, it can touch a cat, but don't hurt the panda. Like, so, so I moved away from that. But uh, yeah, so there was some research and development in that sort of thing too. The, the morphologies, you know. So I mean, I, I lived in the, the 2000s and I was in architecture at the time. So like, yeah, morphologies was everywhere. I also worked for Terraform One in New York for a while. So the whole like biology and like, uh, the plant stuff and all that stuff was certainly always in the work as well. But, all right? Yeah, good question. That's Thank great. You. Yeah, I also have one. I mean, I actually, I actually have two. Uh, first, hey, thank you so much, <laughs> Ryan. I was thought like giving, you gave a different perspective of the same things. It was good. And one question might be a, like uh, kind of personal. It's about your father, and you're talking about so much your father. What does your father do? Like you, I guess he inspired you a lot. Oh wow! Oh, uh, good, good question. Um, yeah. So my uh, my father is a he's electrical engineer um, turned patent attorney. Um, so he's he deals heavily in intellectual property. So, uh, and, and he has been very influential. So when I was about 17, uh, he, I, I don't know why he wanted me involved. I guess this is the kind of dad and lad thing or something like this. Uh, and he was like, could you draw these drawings and, and um, for these patents? And I learned AutoCAD very quickly. Um, and back then it was the the old blue screen with the white square. And so, yeah, I mean, it was horrible. Uh, and, and by when I was, by the time I was five, I had a computer and I had an Atari 800 when I was five and my dad could program and I was learning programming and on BBSs by the time I was like 10 or 11. And so that was always kind of something that pushed me through the kind of progression into um, eventually AutoCAD. And so, and, and then a year later, I, I got a copy of AutoCAD and I started actually using the current one. And, and yeah, and then I, so I've been a patent illustrator since I was about 17. And that led into, um, I started going, so I was, I was biology in college, which that ended very quickly. <laughs> because I, I can't stand lab work and hypotheses. It's too constricting. I, I'm too conceptual. I need, I need my wings to fly. And, um, and so that went into literature and I just like dove in deep. But at the same time, there's this, this CAD side and this computational side. And I was taking CATIA and, and Max and SolidWorks when it first came out and learning all those things side by side with the literature and philosophy. And then it was a it was a cigar and a glass of wine, and they were like, "You do this and you do this. You should be an architect." And and, and the architect in the room was like, "Oh no, that's that's the worst idea ever. Don't be an architect." And I go, "Challenge accepted." <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, no. Are you happy with this? Like you, you accept the challenge. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What was your What was your so, question then? And and my next question about do you think is uh, your style is a kind of rejection of uh, conventional architecture? Do you think that in the that's this way? Um, you know. Uh, to give a little more background, I didn't come to this alone. You know, like I would—I was tricked along the way. You know, uh, so if you, uh, so like John Hayduck, for instance. So my my ex mentor is one of John Hayduck's uh, uh, first assistants. So he he was like this. I think kind of the first generation. Like, He's like 1.5, you know, like Liz and Daniel and Diane were uh, the Liz Diller and Diane Lewis and Daniel Liebeskin. Those and um, oh my God, who's 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 Liz's husband? Oh my God, 
I don't, anyways. Uh, so they were all kind of the first generation and, and J John was there too. And so anyways, he, he kind of fed in and I, I got to hear a bunch of stories um, and, and studying John Hayden. And so John, one of John Hayden's very first classes, I forget what school he was at, um, was by this lady named Henrietta and she was getting him to draw animals with a single line. And, you know, that in the very early work of Hayda comes out in these, these kind of Aesop fables, uh, houses he did. I guess that's how you want to say that. They're, they're, they are houses. And then of course, later he does Aesop fables. So you see this correlation. Um, and I was always looking at, and then I heard a story, which I've told Jan, um, my old mentor, he was, he was in a car with Raymond Abraham and John Haydick, and they were headed to the Chicago Bidinale. And John Haydick started talking about Barbar. -Bar. And you know, the elephant that's in the cartoons. And so, uh, and there was this whole discussion about Barbar. -Bar, and there was a bit of an middle that Barbar -Bar influenced the work. And so if you go and look, at the wall house and a lot of that work you can't help but see it it's all elephants like the wall the part that goes into it the piece on the back i mean it, it, once you see it there's no going back and then like um and so it's always in that work and so that's that's from the beginning and then and in the firm we had these things called animals which was all kind of involved in that and they were these kind of industrial pieces of equipment that were shaped in animals. Uh, and then I got to Cyarch and Tom Wiscom has the same sensibility. And so in most of the, maybe not now, he's in on this kind of ancient architecture thing now, but, uh, but back then it was all like, let's make a dolphin mixed with a wolf and like a, a Shamu mixed with a dinosaur. And so I was never pushed away from it. I was actually, it was pushed, I was pushed further into it. And so to think that it, it was against the architectural kind of schism, it, it isn't really. I mean, like pretty much it's there in most of the work. I, I, I just don't think most people want to admit it. <laughs> it's, that's that's what I think, but I, I certainly that childlike behavior is in a lot of the work. Uh, no, I mean you can find it um, even even in like you could look at like Frank Gehry or like oh well Frank Gehry is a great example. I mean animals are all over it. Uh, I, for instance, Bill Bow he regularly admits the way the why Bill Bow is the way it is is that it's a fish uh, with the head and tail cut off, all right? But it's not a fish when you look at it. It's only a fish when you look at it with the reflection in the water. And so that's the whole fish. So it's the same element that's at uh, in Barcelona. So it's the fish, but it, it's in a, just a different method. And then of course the, um, uh, the D DZ Bank in, in Berlin is it's a horse head and in, 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 in section. And that's because he used to he used to ride horses when he was a kid. And so I mean this is this isn't all work to a certain level. Uh, and I, I think it's fascinating. I, I'm and it, it's a great place to go. I don't think narrative is a great place to come from directly uh, um, or at least admit it. But you certainly, you certainly can have those kind of familiar objects that are in those narratives. Uh, they just don't need to be the justification of the whole building, in my opinion. Did they answer your question? Yeah, <laughs> makes sense. Thank you. Makes sense. So don't be scared to use animals, is what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've never heard that. Everyone inside this has the animals. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, some, some shows, maybe some shows, some not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's true. I mean, and you can't help look at other stuff in the same light. 
I mean, there's something beautiful about a box, and there's something beautiful about uh, a panda. Uh, uh, and a panda. Yeah, there's just both. They're both beautiful. You know, I've I've actually you know. stuffed a panda in a box. That's really beautiful. You know, but um, that's right. that that's the voxel logic, right? You stuff it in a box. Yeah. Shall we leave with this notion of panda being stuffed in a box? <laughs> sure. Ryan, uh, thank you very much for doing this. Uh, let's find a, another good excuse to call each other. Uh, it would be a pleasure. Yes, it would. Um, thank you mainly for doing this because that, that was a sacrifice because you had to get up very early. But then, on the other hand, you've got a very long day ahead. So... Yeah, yeah, there is always a plus side. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, this is actually the very final thing of, of the of the whole week long broadcast. So uh, that this was this was this was the final the finale. I, I mean, oh. and it was it was also the, a very exciting part of all these uh, things. Like th th that's something that that if we had this at the beginning, it everything would be much faster and stronger and and more emphasized. That's a nice thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> no, because you, you, you radiate so much energy. Um, thank you very much one more time. Uh, thank you. I also would like to thank you. <laughs> it was yeah. so interesting yeah. ending conversation. <laughs> it's fantastic. And, um, thank you so and, much. And thank you uh, everybody who, who had still the energy to, to watch us. The two of you who are still with us here on Zoom, even, even though this is an extra day, and uh, thanks everybody who is watching us on Facebook and, and YouTube. And also um, follow the Digital Futures, uh, because I believe that everything that we have recorded is going to be featured there, at least I hope. If not, it's still on our YouTube channel, so you can, you can watch uh, everything that we've done uh, so far already on YouTube, except this, uh, this final day. I will edit the stuff uh, probably early next week because it's been a rough week. It has. Yeah. It has. I also I would like to thank you, Jan. It was like so good. <laughs> In I'm, one I'm, day, like, we start very interesting with the people. I imagine I, it will be like so hard to know these people in one week. So it was like all dance and very interesting, all I see, in a different disciplines actually, like one for fashion, one from the uh, the profession life, and then other part is architecture side and designer side. It was so good, like to know <laughs> all those things, all those I, people to me. Very, I'm ha very happy to hear this. Um, we did our best, all of us. I think that there there were at least twenty people involved, and yeah. Yeah, which is which is a, a sort of a, a big event inside of a huge event, which is the digital futures, sure. where I think there there are like eighty parallel workshops and a lot of speeches and stuff. And because I missed everything, then uh, I will spend the next year or two just watching all the all the videos that everybody. Yeah, has. I was also thinking the same thing <laughs> for the next weeks. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm planning that for years. All right, thank you very much. Uh, have a nice day, and hopefully see you all of you soon. Yes. Somewhere. Maybe. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs> yes. Cheers.